Hailing frequencies are open. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Clear Skies. Uh, as you can see, we've got some of our old friends with us. How y'all doing today? Hi, Joey. <laughs> Hi, Jackson. Hello. Hi. When was the last time Hello. we played together? Uh, Shield, I'm right? Uh, well, on a, on a stream, Shield. You and I played yeah. a, a really fun uh, Star Wars game a while back. Yeah, we where did. I a, where I played a, a, a hut who could punch through just about yeah. anything. But, you, played uh, a, you played a, a hut martial artist Jedi. I did. It was a real good time. Because Jackson, uh, were, were, you a, were you a hut steel hand adapt? I was. I was a hut steel hand adapt that I definitely built so that he could just deliver absurd amounts of damage in the FFG system with like a <laughs> with like a force punch. Um, and then I also he could he could uh, he could create items with the force, so he was constantly like creating bigger <laughs> fists to punch things. It was a, it was a blast. We're, we're five minutes into the Star Trek stream and we're already talking about our Star Wars game. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so uh, yes, it's lovely to have y'all back. Um, so so a quick, some, uh, some quick announcements before we jump into tonight's game. Uh, first of all, before I begin my personal announcements, if you guys have not checked out Star Trek Year 5 yet, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It is some goddamn good Trek. And I'm not just saying that because these crazy people put me in their damn comic. I'm saying it because it's some goddamn good Trek. Um, Jackson, what what issue are you guys up to now? So issue what? 14 uh, comes out in two days. Uh, so it comes out uh, on Wednesday. That's the uh, what is technically the second half of our seventh episode. So every two issues is an episode of, of Star Trek. Um, so you're going to get a full episode every two issues. We've done six up until now, which is the first year. We're going to do another year uh, heading us up to issue 24. And then there's going to be a big fun finale issue for 25. So um, is 14 comes out uh, on Wednesday. And then next month, Jody's next episode starts because it's a writer's room, right? So Colin and I are the showrunners. And then Colin Kelly. Yeah, Colin Kelly. Yeah, and we, have, Colin we, have a, we have a great writing room with Jody Hauser and Brandon Easton and Jim McCann. And the way that that works is that every, uh, basically now for every month, every two months for the next year, that's going to switch around. Um, so Jody's going to do the next two. Colin and I are going to come in and do a, a one-shot special to shake things up. And then uh, from there on out, it's going to be two issues by Jim McCann, two issues by Brandon Easton, and then... The finale shows up with a big three-parter by Colin and I, and then the uh, finale by the whole team. Oh, so man. It's, it's going to rock. And, and I just have to say, because it's been announced, my uh, storyline that starts next month is called Vote for Mud. Yeah. We, uh, we, did not, we did not intend for Vote Mud to be coming out literally <laughs> the during the election. Uh, thanks, Yeah, COVID. Vote Mud. Yeah, that's, yeah, the timing was not uh, <laughs> great. But yes, vote, oh, it is Vote Mud. You're right. Uh, anyway, um, I, I, just I don't know the name that, of it. For, for those of you who have not picked up the comic yet, I'm just going to say two things that got me excited about it. Tholians. An election with Spock, and that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it there. Um, right on. Okay, I pick mine up on Comicsology. So if y'all aren't able to swing by a comic book shop, I highly recommend it. It's pretty rad. And if you um, want, to, and if you want physical copies, both uh, the first two trades, which cover the entire first year I just talked about, are out now. So you can just oh, you can go you can go on Amazon or to your local comic book shop, which oh, is ideal, sweet. and you can get the trades, um, which is a great way to take in the book. Support your local comic book store. Do it. Uh, the next big announcement we have is Predation has been announced. So those of you who uh, were not a member of the Patreon and you didn't get a chance to see uh, our Patreon exclusive announcements, it came a little bit early. Uh, Predation, our Dino campaign, based on the the it's based in the setting of Monty Cook, uh, written by Shanna Germain. Uh, it's going to be starting October third. It'll be premiering on Saturdays at noon. I've already gotten a bunch of people telling me VOD Squad is going to be mighty on this one. <laughs> um, but it will be uh, Saturdays at noon, starting October 3rd. Um, funny enough, the math checks out. We're going to be doing a Halloween episode, apparently, on October 31st. <laughs> so that'll nice. be fun. Um, yeah, and we have uh, Ravity, Gina, uh, Sam, and one B. Dave Walters is going to be uh, a part of this Halloween campaign. Yeah, so it'll be nice to, to finally play with B. Dave because we have not gotten a chance to really game with him at all. Um, so that's going to be good. Uh, and uh, more details will be coming out that soon, so stay tuned. The title of the show is Secrets of Silver Creek. Ooh, who came up with that? Um, all right. Uh, the next couple of announcements I have is some birthday wishes because we got a lot. So obviously, I want to wish a huge stinking happy birthday to Chandra. 
who is our elder mod, who is a, a, a bedrock uh, of our community and one of the uh, most supportive people we have in the community that helps make the stream punks happen. Um, she had her birthday on Saturday and happy birthday, Chandra. Thank you. Um, also a big shout out to Rick Bud, who has also had his birthday. Good old buddy, Rick Bud. Um, some exciting news will be coming down the pipe uh, I, I'm told regarding a one Rick Bud in the future, so I'm eagerly awaiting to hear what's up with that. Um, and also, you're never going to see this, Walter Koenig, but happy birthday! Mm. For, for every he is he is one of the original actors that I have met. I met him in a collectible store. He approached me because he wanted to buy Star Trek collectibles. <laughs> He was gifting them out and we ended up having a conversation and it was the moment of my life. Like uh, I didn't, I not even at STLV. Well, except for the part where Bonnie kind of embarrassed herself in the elevator with Robert Picardo, which was, was really was good. Priceless. That was priceless. I'll admit that. And you and Bonnie on stage singing uh, at karaoke was priceless. But aside from those amazing moments, this one was pretty amazing. So happy birthday, Walter Koenig. We love you and we love Chekhov. Um, that's all I've got on my very winded announcement slus. Yes, Xander. Yes, I've got a couple of things. Uh, first, coming up tomorrow is the finale for my three shot of Altered Carbon featuring the Osaka supplement, which uh, Aki is creating and it will be debuting Ooh. later on. Uh, but we're doing a sort of sneak peek with it. I've got uh, Melee Damage, uh, Gabe Hicks, Michelle Wynn Bradley, uh, and Marquis McCarty, and I'm GMing it, and that's on Hunter's Entertainment. Uh, and very, very excited for that. Yay! Yay. Right on. Yes, Aki. Uh, next week, starting on, on Wednesday at 6 o'clock, I will be playing Tales from the Loop with Caitlin. Yeah. Um, she Jeez. is going to be uh, GMing. I've been dying to play Tales from the Loop, begging people to run it for me, and finally I get to play it with Caitlin, and I couldn't be more excited. But we'll be doing about three or four episodes of that. It's called Into the Loop, and uh, we start next week. Sweet. Gina. I'm just putting pressure on you. You're the only one that yeah. hasn't announced anything. So I'm just like, and Gina. Well, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm going to do predation. Like, you did it already. And, like, I like pizza. <laughs> um, uh, uh, give, give more love over to um, Pixel Circus if yes. you want to see me and Xander um, be adorable, wholesome. Uh, I'm old and you're adorable. That's that's Thanks. about it. <laughs> and Vince Casso. Not only is he a wonderful ray of sunshine, he's pretty to look at. So yeah, yeah. A bonus a on, good every, cat. on every level. All right. I think I'm just going to pretend that in the distance I can hear Sam Delev screaming, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm sure they are, though. I'm so. sure they're in chat right now screaming, I'm excited. <laughs> so hide your hearts. <laughs> Without further ado, let's go ahead and begin tonight's episode of Clear Skies. Welcome back, everybody. Let's go ahead and jump into tonight's episode. For those of you who need the quick recap, of course, half of our crew is currently on the other side of the galaxy. 
literally on the opposite side of Rom the Romulan Star Empire uh, to the galactic north in the Alpha Quadrant at 1 Nimbus 3, a notorious planet that you might remember from Star Trek V, The Voyage Home, a, a movie that gets a lot of deserved shade, but it's also kind of fun, so I don't know, whatever. Um, that being said, on the opposite end of where the, this mission is un, uh, under unfolding at Nimbus 3, on our end of the galaxy right now, out in Shackleton Expanse, what was previously unexplored territory now known as the Yukovar system, far beyond the boundaries of what has been typically scanned by the Federation, still mostly un unexplored territory out here in the Shackleton Expanse. The USS Ross is currently at stations keeping about 20,000 kilometers from the Particle Observer Station created and controlled by the Dishashian people. This was where the USS Ross had its first encounter with the Dishashians, and a memorable one it was at that, coming to the rescue, saving them from Gorn pirates, and then learning that you had just met a post-warp species very new to the galaxy that was thrilled and ecstatic to meet new spacefaring creatures out there, which set off a whole chain reaction of adventures back on their planet of Jadaran. One thing that you all took away from yourself with, with the Jashashians is the Jashashians seem to have a unique ability, a unique technology of being able to study subspace. This is something that every galactic species would like to be able to do a little bit more efficiently. The Jashashians seem to have an ability to predict when and where spatial anomalies might appear with startling accuracy. And this station is currently orbiting a particle fountain. For those of you who don't remember, particle fountains are spatial anomalies that Starfleet knows very little about. They are varied in size, but for the most part, they are, yes, Jody, massive. They're also um, highly dangerous, and Starfleet, if you've watched Star Trek Voyager, Starfleet has recorded the loss of 12 vessels over the course of their encounters with particle fountains and their attempts to study them. So for the most part, they are considered incredibly dangerous and starships are told to keep away. However, you all had the remarkable happenstance of discovering this particle fountain and making first contact, which led to the discovery of this technology that could help you study subspace. Incidentally, technology that might also help you detect cloak vessels. On your way back to the Shackleton Expanse, your intention was to make contact with the planet of Jadaran and the Jashashian people to see if there could be a technology exchange. Now that they are being formally talked to and engaged with by the Federation, they have been deemed a friendly species who is very enthusiastic, particularly because, you know, you saved their homeworld from the rebirth of the crystalline entity. They seem to be pretty amenable to your exchanges. On your way back, however, to negotiate this technology exchange, you received a distress call from the Particle Observer Station. Now, as a quick recap on this, the Particle Observer Station is the only deep space facility the Shashian people have. It is their most advanced facility that they have ever built and farthest away from home that they've ever done. And it is designed specifically to observe a brand new particle fountain that they predicted was going to emerge at the location that it did. Quite extraordinary. Upon arrival, you discovered that the station had been damaged from what looked like plasma scorching along the sides of its larger hull. Commander Exio, currently in command of the USS Ross, ordered yellow alert, suspecting that this was going to be a hazardous situation. It had been cl made clear to the command staff that the station had come under attack. And after contacting Particle Observer Station, our beloved scientist, the Jashashian that you've all come to know and respect, um, that would be Dr. Yugos, revealed that the station indeed had come under attack and actually revealed sensor footage. Now, of course, the Jashashian people are not that advanced with their technology. So the sensor footage was sort of like on par with high definition photo shots, basically, taken from their station. Their sensor technology is mostly data streamed um, and it's difficult to pick up visual identification markers the way that you guys can with your sensors. What you did see was the silhouette of a modified Tavaro class Romulan warbird before it cloaked, supposedly. Meaning, 
this ship approached in full view, fired off a warning shot and cloaked. And it was at that point that the crew of the USS Ross realized that this was a trap, that they had been lured here by Admiral Mendak. And almost on cue, Mendak appeared on your view screen and made his demands known. He wants Sorex. He's given the USS Ross two hours to decide whether or not they're handing over Sorex. This is a problem because for the first time since leaving space dock, Sorex is not on board the USS Ross. Sorex is on the other side of the damn quadrant on a secret mission with Captain Sull. You've got two hours. You've come up with a wild plan to try to discharge some kind of torpedo or, or probe into deep space near the particle fountain to cause a chain reaction that will hopefully cause this Romulan warbird, which you all know can fire while cloaked, rendering it visible, which would dramatically change the odds. Here's the problem. You're not entirely sure what this is going to do. <laughs> you're pretty sure you'll be all right, <laughs> but you're not entirely sure what this is going to do. This is an experimental, <laughs> this is an experimental solution to a big problem. And you're also going to have to use alien tech through the Jashashian people that you're not quite familiar with. You've got two hours to figure this out. Chief Tech and Vryn have dashed into the turbo lift and have gone down to Cetacean Ops to have an immediate conversation with Dr. Yada. That is where we are picking up tonight's game. Dr. Yada floating right behind the glass, looking at you, Chief Tech, and the Cetacean officer just says, I'm not the one that can help you with this, I'm afraid, Chief. No, well, I mean, for part of it. You see, the subspace technology that they developed is very much like underwater technology. I hear the theory, and it does have a certain poetry to it that, of course, I appreciate. But in all honesty, mapping subspace and actually understanding how to manipulate subspace anomalies is not exactly my strong suit. And the head bobs a little bit, almost as if that was communication of a laugh or a chuckle, mm -hmm. like a nervous tick. But uh, uh -huh. you hear... Just as Vryn is about to speak up, you both just go, uh, at the same time. And, but there are two people aboard the USS Ross that I think, if you can deal with their eccentricities, uh, is that the correct way of saying that word? No, I told you, Lacat is on the away mission. Otherwise, no, I'm no, 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 not Lacat. Oh. There are two scientists on board that I've had the pleasure of coming to know in the past few weeks. And apparently they've always been here. <laughs> oh, what a thing to say. <laughs> well, they've been locked away in one of the module laboratories pretty much for the duration of our mission since we left Space Dock months and months and months ago. But I think you'll find them to be quite interesting. Okay. I, in fact, I... Why don't I call for them? And... Oh. We can meet here. Sure. There's a chirping sound in your laboratories. The two of you have been sitting in sort of a dim glow, almost oblivious to the lethal situation. Right now, the Ross is at, you, uh, at yellow alert. You can see the, the lining of the wall flickering. Um, you did hear the klaxon, but this has happened numerous times, and it hasn't interfered with the work. So you kind of just go about your business, observing safety protocols as necessary, and back to the research. But now you hear the familiar voice of a rather respected colleague, Dr. Yada, head of Cetacean Ops, and a expert, one of the top expert minds in the Federation at mapping um, subspace anomalies, as well as charting unknown space. And you hear the chirp come in. Doesn't, doesn't immediately speak out your names. Kind of just lets the chirp linger so as to not interrupt any work and waits for you simply to respond. Um, so uh, just to paint the visual picture for a hot second, mm -hmm. messy laboratory um, insofar <laughs> as there's just sort of half built projects uh, all across the space. Uh, there is an industrial sized Starfleet lock um, built onto the inside and outside of the um, of the, the uh, bulkhead door, and the light is relatively low. Um, two Vulcans uh, 
are the only occupants of this lab. Uh, one uh, is hunched over a um, what looks kind of like a, a metallic uh, brain, uh, effectively, and is like uh, probing it with small probes. And uh, what's what's the other doing, Johnny? Uh, she's just sitting there, eyes closed. Uh, it would almost look like meditation, perhaps. Lost uh, in thought. So when the so when the chirp goes off, neither of us necessarily respond. Um, but instead, uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm sort of messing with the probes, and I I just go, um, sister. I do believe we are being summoned by the communications array. Would you like to disable it so I might get on with the rest of my work? It would be logical to first find out why they are contacting us. You and your logic. <laughs> Fine. Brain, what do you think? And the brain just goes, input not recognized. <laughs> right. Then I continue messing with right? <laughs> Angrily shouts at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You make, 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 makes, a, makes a horrible sound. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and does not recognize. Oh, and then Jesus. There's a Vulcan <laughs> building a Dalek down the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> My God, I let Jack into the Star Trek crossing the for five minutes. What do you think about that, Captain? Is your Cole? sister the Corsair? It's, it's shocking, shockingly, it's not me. But... I know, right? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I just continue on with the brain. Um, uh, I, 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 as soon as it's clear he's not going to answer, I just, yes? Ah, Tavek, uh, this is Dr. Yada. I wonder if I could borrow both you and Stavek for a moment uh, here on Citation Ops. There's a rather unique problem that our chief engineering needs help with. It, of course, concerns the survival of the ship. Then we shall be on our way. Excellent, excellent. I look forward to seeing you. It's been six months? Chirp deactivates. <laughs> that was. You just volunteered quite a lot of our time, sister. If the ship is destroyed, all of our work will go with it. So that is probably the priority to take, uh, to take our attention. And it, there's sort of a, a pause. And then he just throws the tools in the air and goes, fine. Who needs a brain anyway? And I stand up and calm yourself. I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> um, true, but my brain requires no further tinkering. It could require some calming. You and your colonar. Indeed. Let us see if uh, perhaps, uh, let us see how it handles the next stressful scenario. And then you can proceed to prescribe me any further calming. We'll cut to Vryn leaning yeah, we, over. We, we put our chief. hand on the lock and it opens the lock. <laughs> Vryn leans over to you, Chief, as you are currently standing a across from these two Vulcan siblings. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Vryn goes, have you ever seen these two in your life? I'm gonna lean in close to see what sort of pips they have to denote what ranks they are. Civilian scientists. Um, <laughs> Two civilians. Yep. Um, so, Chief, um, <clears throat> in order to prepare for this moment, uh, Yada did give you a quick personnel file on who you're talking to. Great. You were talking to two of the top minds from the Daystrom Institute that have been stationed here on the USS Ross and have not been seen really at almost any social function uh, since you have all arrived. Mm -hmm. um, this, uh, there is, uh, there are siblings named Tevek and Stavek. You know that they offer some pretty specialized skill sets for what it is they do, but according to the personnel file, working together, these two have produced some remarkable out of the box uh, innovations in both engineering and science. Uh, Tech sort of leans over back and says, they remind me of Binar. <clears throat> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vryn just kind of nods. <laughs> By the way, you two find yourself in Cetacean Ops. Now Cetacean Ops is, for a lot of people like to, to work in Cetacean Ops because it is calming. This entire area has got kind of that 
aqua effect of lighting moving across the floors and along the walls. This wall of glass in front of you, and on the other side are all the Cetitian office, uh, officers moving and swimming about, going about work and interacting with holographic displays. You can see a big three-dimensional holographic display of the Shackleton Expanse, in fact, currently being displayed in the middle of Cetitian Ops itself. Dr. Yada though, is one of the largest of the species in here, an Odanian, um, looks like sort of like a false killer whale would be the best way to describe him. About the same size, so quite large. Has what looks like two ribbons of energy and metal along the sides of his head that allows him to interact and communicate through um, both the universal translator of the computer and also access and manipulate the hollow emitters here on his, on his deck. On the other side of the glass from him is Lieutenant Vren, who is the helms officer and senior staff. Um, an Andorian with uh, his signature chops going down to about the mid, mid part of his jaw. Uh, a young kid, but also you are aware, um, really good at his job and a veteran of the Dominion War. And standing next to him is a Bolian known as Chief Tech. Um, Chief, do you want to go ahead and describe yourself? Yeah, uh, Chief has got his sort of engineering scrubs on uh, and is standing in front of you very uh, militaristically uh, with his arms behind him. And as you come in, he's he's a, a larger Bolian who enjoys food, uh, uh, but there's a sort of gentle uh, aura around him. Uh, but as you sort of walk, walk up, he acknowledges both of you and says, I do not mean to alarm you, citizens, but we are in a bit of a pickle. Uh, to put it in the military terms. So uh, we are just going to take care of this yellow alert here with your help, and we just don't want to cause a panic. Uh, but there is a cloaked Romulan ship that is aiming to destroy us within two hours. So, uh, Interesting. I, a quick eyebrow to Tavek, and then back to Tech. I okay. have a query. I figure you might, uh, and we are available to answer any questions just as fast as possible. What, what notification was given to the civilian craft operating at warp nine in a warp five civilian zone? Watch out. A cetacean. And then like the <sighs> smallest little smile pops Vryn just goes Vryn leans over to you chief and goes I think I love this guy oh no oh no we're doomed <laughs> <laughs> is this really the time for jokes brother there is always time to shake up the cognition of those who are in a panic perhaps we should play some Klingon opera while we think of our solutions Oh, that's an interesting solution for sure. But we do have to take into account the environment for the other workers and they may not appreciate that. <laughs> so I guess, do you want to head down to engineering? We can work on this probe or torpedo or whatever it is we want to do. Tell, tell, yes. Yes. Perhaps you should fill us in along the way of what plans you have in motion already and how we can be of assistance. Yes, you okay, seem so um, reasonable. I would love to talk with you. And Tech just sidles up next to you. Okay. If I am nothing else, I am reasonable. <laughs> oh, finally. Um, the, so the, the four of you leave and head to the turbo lift and maneuver down to main engineering where you are both going to create a theoretical piece of technology and fire it into it, one of the most dangerous spatial anomalies that Starfleet's ever encountered. Back up on the bridge. <laughs> um, yes. On the view screen, Commander, you see the rather peaceful slight spin of the particle observer station. It's It would be a tragedy if something happened to this. This is one of the few achievements that the Dishashian people have managed to acquire. And if you remember the defeat in Yugos's voice last time you spoke to him about how this is the second time you've had to rescue him from his workstation and how it just seems he, there's, he's starting to get the feeling that the galaxy isn't ready for the Dishashians. They're <laughs> typically the other... reminded him that he's just not met that many people yet. Right. <laughs> It's a kind of a maddening calm up on the bridge. You're aware that the clock is ticking, particularly because you were directly linked to the internal chronometers, but it's just that steady hum of the bridge 
the occasional chirp of the station being accessed, and the quiet. You have been currently at station keeping. Since they left the bridge, it's been about 10 minutes. So, waiting for updates. I don't wait for updates. I... Would you like to... (sighs) Well, it sounds like a meeting time, because... I can just press OK to any update I need, so... That's true. Um, it's meeting time. Um, <laughs> Ambassador Olin, um, uh, Lieutenant uh, Gers, and I am currently blanking on their name, but the but the wonderful person who knows all of the laws of the galaxy. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, uh, Yeoman Chanto. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yo- and Yeoman Chanto. Yeoman Chanto, who's, who's sitting to your right right now on the other side of the command station. She looks over and you says, yes, Commander. You, and the moment she answers you, XEO, every protocol that you have programmed into you to register body language, she, yes. she is very nervous. And she kind of said, yes, Commander, a little quickly. You can sense the anxiety. Olin, you are getting anxiety from all over the ship. Everyone knows there's a Romulan lurking out there right now. There's sort of like that pre-battle jitters. You you kind of get that. You're kind of getting waves of emotion from people who are both anxious. Some people are waiting. Some people are just wanting to fight already. Um, and some are some are just filled with like concern for the citizens on board the ship. And it's it's always like this before a tense situation. But but Asmi stands up and says, "Yes, uh, Commander." I think it's time we go make some concurrent plans with a possible explosion, shall we? Yes, Commander. <clears throat> um, into the ready room. Okay. Olin, Shanto, your senior staff basically is currently on staff. They all enter your ready room. As you move in, you almost for a split second, XEO, it's just a new sensation to enter the ready room and not see Captain Sull in their chair. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't actually have this program, but I want to be downloading the Captain Sull program into my body at the moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, everyone moves I'm, into the it, room. Normally, I would be taking their cadence right now to calm the crew, but I am actually staying... Um, within my own cadence to instill confidence that I am confident in what is going to happen. Okay. Um, Because I have no intention of fighting today. Um, I know that the instinct will be to protect our ship with violence. However, there are too many innocent people within reach that this could go very badly. Now, Ambassador, the next time that man calls, I would like you to be on the call with me. If if not so, taking the call yourself. Understood, Commander, of course. I think his assessment of me to not even allow himself to see truth shows quite a huge weakness in his ability to be a general. Um, or an admiral, at that matter. Um, He is ignorant of body language, and that is useful to us. Um, So seeing me as weak is a very good um, asset at the moment. And in stepping down as communicator in this instance, might gain us some um, leverage. Asmi nods and says, you raise a good point, Commander. I mean, Romulans are notoriously distrustful of sentient technologies. I think, in this case, he may have dramatically underestimated you. People tend to. (laughs) It's usually not a mistake they care to uh, make twice, that being said, once they've learned the lesson. Yes. So, I would like all of the fine expert minds in this room to assist me in making an alternate plan. Well, I had some thoughts. Oh, sorry, Commander. Oh, no, please. I was just going to start talking about explosions, and that might not ease the anxiety in this room. 
<laughs> Bajoran rings her hands for a moment and she looks at everybody and says, well, I don't know how well he'll respond to this. Romulans tend to be somewhat maverick when it comes to this kind of thing, but we do have a treaty with the Romulan Star Empire right now. Threatening a Federation starship in unclaimed space like this would be a violation of the treaty and an act of war. It m might help the ambassador if we just rem gently remind him that if he starts something with the Ross, it's not going to end with the Ross. The thing I've been trying to do for the last couple of weeks is get a hold of whoever it is the FDC has sent to Romulus on our behalf. Unfortunately, I haven't really gotten any response on that, but I've been trying. It would be nice to know who that is so that we could lever that, leverage that against uh, Mendak as well. If we claim we have whoever it is on the line and at our disposal to contact, that might also help uh, us to get him to back down. I can get whoever it is that's on my crew right now to continue to dig for it, but that's essentially what I've been trying to concentrate my efforts on. Am Ambassador, I have a question. As Michanto raises her hand, the yeoman just pauses for a second and says, is it possible to contact the Romulan embassy on Narendra Station? I guess I could certainly try. They're the closest in range and pretty much the only contact I can have with uh, the Romulans at this point. That being said, uh, Mendak has interfered with our communications with Narendra before, and I don't doubt he will be on the lookout for further communica communications and likely attempting to intercept whatever communications we might make. So if we do do that, we're going to have to make sure we have our absolute top uh, security people on the line, making sure that nothing is being interfered with. Uh, Lieutenant Gers speaks up at that point, the bullion who is currently covering security and tactical, and they just nod and say, um, any attempt to communicate outside of the area, I'm almost certain Mendak is going to attempt to jam. We could try to counter it, but... Any I'm communication we will be trying to hide from him will um, might detract from our timeline. It might be an act that would trigger him to immediately attack. There's silent nods coming from the junior officers. Unfortunately, I don't think that communication with Narendra is going to be the easiest thing to achieve. I am I would love to be able to attempt it, but I know that anything, anything less than just a bold cry for help would immediately probably just escalate things further. And escalation is the last thing we need right now. So we do this. We de-escalate as much as possible. The We will never convince him that um, that uh, Sorex is not I, 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 I going to call him Dr. Wellens again. We have 400 NPCs in this game. Don't even sweat it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we will not convince him that Sorex is not on this ship. Um, so we have to operate for the rest of this mission as though he is, um, and protect it thusly. Uh, we de-escalate, we prepare to expose him with the particle bomb, and we pull a card from our great Captain Sol and try to arrest him with the tractor beam. Once he's exposed, let's catch him and make him answer for his crimes. And then we can send our transmission once all is controlled. I wonder if there is any value to telling him that a call to Narendra Station is imminent if he doesn't back down. It's a tactic I'm willing to take. There will be probably several phone calls before this bomb goes off, and I intend to make all of them. And then we see where the cards lie. Shall we attempt contact now, Ambassador? Are you ready? I am as ready as I believe I will ever be, Commander. All right. Let's see what this information gets us and then makes the next step. This is incredible, but for the first time that I can remember, we're going to use a communications check. 
<laughs> I can't remember. It must have been sometime on Shield of Tomorrow, but I can't remember the last time I called for communications roll. Um, this want, is what's that? Want to roll it, Tech? I was going to ask Xander if he wanted to roll it. Yeah. So Ross, whoever, and I'm going to have to roll on behalf of I think our science officer is probably the best person to do this. Control acting science officer Talon, junior grade Benzite. So let's see. Um, they are going to roll. Let's. I think if this would be. No, probably not. Then. It's either way. It's going to be tough. Yeah, either way, it's going to be tough. Let's see. Eight. Well. Okay. So yeah, it'll be it'll be Rogers is going to make the roll. Our bully and security officer is going to try to secure channel. Okay. And then is it communications con? For the Ross, this is going to be communications. This would probably be communications security. Okay. Um, and I'm going to set the difficulty. Let's see. You're trying to actually, I might. Why don't I do this? I'm going to spin threat to add to to so that i can make this a trait that you guys are trying to get past communications are being jammed oh so uh gonna... question question What's um are, is this all ha operating under the assumption that we are um contacting narendra or that we are contacting um mendek because we are trying to call mendek oh mendek i'm yeah. sorry no you yeah don't have to... okay i was oh, like yeah. this is a lot of threat i think sorry, you'd want to answer right yeah <laughs> sorry i thought you were contacting narendra if you're contacting mendek that's literally just opening up a channel exactly oh, okay. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, 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 no role necessary. Although, you know what? Why don't we? Why don't not, Why don't we be nice and we'll do a role anyway? The momentum. And momentum, exactly. So, start this episode off right. So difficulty will be zero. Great. Um, so this is going to be a communications, and this would be a communications command check. Okay. For the Ross. Okay. One that's success. one. One success here. So gain two momentum. Okay, you all stride back out onto the bridge. Everyone assuming their position, uh, your security officer moves up to the tactical station. You hear the familiar telltale signs of the chime. And then moments later, hailing frequencies are open, Commander. If he's out there, he can hear you. And whoever was going to speak. Mm. Um, just for visual, because I'm sure that they can see us, even if we might not be able to see them. Um, only if you want them to see you. You don't have to activate your your view screen. You can be audio only if you want. Okay. Um, I'm going to put visual since we are trying to um, okay. uh, show uh, submissiveness on my part. So I'm going to be sitting down in the center chair rather than standing and addressing. Okay. All right, hailing frequencies are open. And Olin will be standing uh, just slightly ahead of the commander and kind of look back to her just for a moment, just to get the final confirmation. You get the nod. This is Ambassador Olin Marginil of the Federation Diplomatic Corps. I'm speaking to you on behalf of the USS Ross to ask that you please uh, disengage from your current course of action. Remember that in uncharted space, you are in violation of the treaty between the Federation and the Romulans. And if you take any aggressive action towards us, you risk the tenuous peace we have worked so long to create. You are a man of honor. This much we know about you. And I do not believe that you would put at risk everything we have fought so hard to build in these last few years just because of some man named Sorix. We ask not only that you give us more time, but that you leave the Jashashians alone, for they are of no threat to either of us and have done nothing to deserve your ire, using them as a tool to get us to, to bend to your will. I'm sorry, but that is a course that ends in folly for both of us. This is between you and this is between us. Why don't we keep it that way? Make a presence plus command roll. Okay. 
I? Gosh, I haven't rolled for Olin in so long. Ugh. Yeah. And this is going to be contested. Mm-hmm. And you can take the idea of this is one. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take a momentum for an extra die. Now, you are on board the USS Ross. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, the Ross has diplomatic suites and stuff to actually help boost any diploma, uh, diplomacy rolls. I believe diplomacy that. rolls. Now, I know that technically when they, they are on board... Yeah, diplomatic suites. Never mind. I'm sorry. That's actually if Fine. diplomacy is conducted on board the Ross. Um, Nuts. I was trying to help no. you out there. Oh, I, I might be able to help. Way. I'm quickly looking up what advisor oh. does because I might be able oh. to give them a thing. I just haven't used it in so long. Yeah. I also right, right. <laughs> okay. You, did you say the difficulty was one? It was or one. It, 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 it's like, this though, is yeah. like combat. It's social combat. So the difficulty, just like in a fist fight, it, the difficulty is one to hit. But you have to you have to basically beat him. Right. I, I want to go ahead and use the talent of diffuse the tension. Um, I'm using my focuses of diplomacy and negotiations. Uh, and I think I'm also going to burn a value. Um, okay. Uh, but you tell me which one works best. Uh, I, I'm either, I'm thinking meet them where they are might be the best one. Yeah, that would work. Okay. Yeah, totally. That gives me an auto crit. I'm going to uh, spend I, threat to gain an extra die here. Yeah, and I also have an extra die as well. So okay, cool. And, and then, um, Gina, don't... Gina's checking advisor really. Yeah, fast. I was gonna say, why don't you hold off on rolling until we get Gina's yeah. advisor? There's, there's the the quick link that's in the Trello, Gina, that gives you access to all of the talents. That's what I'm trying to. F- <laughs> it's I, funny. I, I, can, I can send it to you really fast. It's. I will say, playing remotely has opened up a world of convenience and also feeling lost. <laughs> Where you're just like, oh, everything's at my fingertips. Oh my god, Where everything is, is at my fingertips. Where the hell am I? <laughs> yeah, I miss. I, I will tell y'all. I really miss having a GM screen in front of me. <laughs> I, I, I I take the philosophy is super super convenient and fun and like like. I don't know. Builds atmosphere. Having a good old GM screen in front of you. Jason Carl's GM screen. Side note. Gorgeous. Dogmite did that. Oh, Beautiful. yeah. Gina, go ahead. I do. I have, I found it. Um, yeah. uh, it. What are you rolling, Aki? I'm rolling my presence command. Great. Um, uh, I get. I this this is applicable. Yay. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, I'm going to assist. Uh, using my advisor talent, which means that any character I'm um, assisting, um, they can re-roll a command roll. Um, so you get one free re-roll. Um, and I'm doing this by performing as meek behind you while also being supportive. And your speech in the ready room would totally count for that too, by the way. Thank so, you. Um, right. So yeah, go ahead and y'all roll your dice and do your thing. And okay. I'll roll my Here we go. Uh, mm, oh my God, that's the worst rolls I've ever. <laughs> that's so terrible. Okay. Oh my God. I that is the worst roll I've ever. Wow. Re rolls. I I had one re roll. I rolled that to to do the to re roll the complication, but I still rolled a sixteen and eighteen and a seventeen, so only got three successes. That's pretty yeah. impressive that you landed a success with those rolls. I know. I got. I only got three. That's... I would have only gotten one without without burning my determination. That okay. was the worst roll I've ever ever gotten. How'd you do, Gina? <laughs> so suspenseful. Crit. <laughs> <laughs> so five successes. Okay. So the ambassador stares ahead at this empty black void in front of them, speaking out towards the stars, knowing that there's a Romulan admiral out there that's lurking who can hear. And a few minutes stretch by, and it passes that threshold where you're not sure if he's going to respond. When you hear your security officer say, message coming in, you beat him by two. So you see Mindak appear on the screen. You see, again, Mindak's face, his countenance, just like he's always had, is as stoic as you've ever seen a Romulan. His 
His demeanor is, I would never characterize it as smug, but every word that comes through his mouth is spoken with absolute assurance that he is superior, that he has the upper hand, and that he is the better person. As he appears on the screen, you hear him, a low hum come out of his mouth for a moment as he, almost like he's acknowledging that Olin is now standing in front of him. He quirks a brow in an almost Vulcan-like manner for a Romulan and says, Ambassador Olin Marginil, there's no reason that innocent people should die here today, and I take no pleasure threatening their lives. I'm amenable to discussing this, if you wish. My terms are quite simple. You have a Romulan citizen on board your vessel. I want him returned. I understand your position, and I understand why you feel you need him now, but we are in a position where we don't quite understand why he is so vital and important to you. If we could have some clarity, it would help us immensely. You see, Sorix has been very ill and under our care, and we cannot release someone to you without full assurances that he would be cared for. And I am afraid the only person who can help him is our doctor. You think he's trying to get a measure of you for a moment. Because the silence between your statements and when he speaks again is long enough where you're not sure if he actually heard you. Has he formally requested asylum? He has. Well, then I hate to tell you this, Ambassador, but the man is a criminal, and I want him returned to me immediately. We are aware of his past actions, but that does not negate the fact that he is under our care and our protection. You tell us that he is a criminal. We understand that he has, at least for the Federation, done some fairly questionable things that in our own government would get him into quite a bit of trouble. But we don't have any understanding of what it is that he has done to you. So I'm afraid that you are asking us to extradite a criminal to you who we have yet to properly deal with and cannot do so until he is mentally sound and fit to stand for his crimes. That does create a bit of a problem, Ambassador. From where I stand, I would call this interference in the internal affairs of the Romulan Star Empire, harboring a known criminal from an enemy of the state then I fear that we find ourselves again at an impasse. But I don't see why you and I can't work that out. My terms are simple. I've stated them before. Unless you're willing to change, the clock is ticking, and the Dishashians are running out of time. This threat feels low, even for you. I cannot help but believe that an admiral of your station, stature, and general complement of deeds would stoop to this level. The communication ends. Just cuts off. Just, you see the black space in front of you again. I don't know if he's going to be chewing on that one for a while, but I did the best I could, at least for now. He spoke with you. That's more than he gave me. Olin, I can also give you this. In that conversation, you got the sense that he really does not want to destroy that station. With that many successes, you didn't only just get him to talk to you, but you got a sense of where he's coming from. He really does not want to do it. His convictions are not as clear, but it seems like he doesn't want to do it. I'm not entirely sure this is all him. I don't know if you got that too, but he might also be between some rock and hard place that he's struggling to get out of, because he's definitely not got his heart in this. I 
This is going to be an entirely diplomatic and legal situation. I need to find out exactly who has the legal right over an asylum seeker who is a criminal. To Yeoman both. Shanto immediately stands up and goes, I'll get on that right away, uh, Thank Commander. You. And she dashes towards the back library computer into the rear of the bridge, sits down at one of the engineering stations and says, transfer database to this console, please. The computer chirps away and she just goes. <sighs> Ambassador, I yes. think you're right. I think if he can avoid, if we can provide hard proof that he does not have the legal right over Sorax, he may back down. If his wish is to not have him for personal not, reasons. Yes. I wonder if there is enough of an opening from that conversation to at least try Narendra. If he's looking for yeah. a way out, he might actually let us find one for him. I would say that is an excellent call. Then if you'll excuse me, I think I'm going to be in the diplomatic suites for a moment. If you I would might need somebody on security to keep an eye on the lines. Yes. Um, you take uh, um, uh, Lieutenant Gers. Um, who is your second? Make Eric Hunt for Oxford. What's up? Ox crew, please. Um, oh, you need ox crew? We got ox uh, crew. Yes. We got ox crew coming out of our ears. Who is Lieutenant Gers's second? Uh, second in command. Technically, that could be anybody. Let me just pull up yeah. our ox crew list. What's ox up, y'all? Let's bust out some ox crew -ness. Let's do it. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted on our Patreon with this huge database. We've got a bunch of wonderful scenes that we're going to try to get to. And we have this beautiful big database of ox crew that we love to pull from. And let me just pop this open. We're going to say this ox crew is June Robinson, human lieutenant. She okay. hers. Um, please call for Lieutenant June Robinson. They will assist you, Ambassador. All right, and uh, Nolan makes a beeline for the um, turbo lift and heads down to the diplomatic suites. All right. Um, so this is Security Officer June Robinson is going to meet you down there. Um, In the meantime, I'm going to roll for Yeoman Shanto. I need you, if you could, Xander, to roll for the Ross. This is going to be <laughs> Shanto's. This is like that episode where Picard is digging through treaties to try to get the Shelly Act to knock it the crap off. Um, all right, so I'm going to have uh, Xander. I'm going to have you roll computers. This would probably be. Mm, this might be computers. This would probably be computer's command. Okay. Shanto is going to roll. The difficulty of this, I'm going to set this. Oh, I'll set this as challenging. I'm going to set this at three. Okay. Um, do you want as me to? Yes, we have three in the pool, so we have one to burn if you'd like. Okay, so as me. Is there any way I can assist, and not necessarily as the commander, but as sort of a. a... A di uh, you know, a prime order. directive for yeah, an order. Oh yeah, you want her to call upon determination? She does have yeah, the value. Yeah, I would like for her to do that. Okay. She's going to call upon the value. No detail is too small. There you go. And she has a specialty in interstellar law. So. <laughs> She's digging the um, Yeah, finally. It's good to have a lawyer on board your ship, eh, guys? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. This is going to be control. Uh, okay, that's a crit. Nice. Uh, what did you, what did, what did the uh, Ross do? Okay, okay. I'm a big dum dum. I should have rolled four twenty uh, d twenties on that last roll because I used diffuse attention, but I didn't. Oops. <laughs> Oops. It's okay. You still you still won that. Um, that was still a victory on your part. You guys gained one momentum as uh, uh -huh. Yeoman Asmi Shanto, the intrepid, the uh, aspiring JAG officer, basically um, digs through all of the data, going 
through everything from the treaties of the neutral zone, um, most notably digging through uh, the Treaty of Algernon, I believe it's it's called, with that the, the Federation signed with the Romulans. Um, she is digging deep to look for anything she can. Uh, meanwhile, down in main engineering, we cut to, if you can imagine, the camera in that island that is in the center of main engineering. Now, the USS Ross does have a very similar layout to a Galaxy-class starship. She is slightly bigger, however. Her warp core is much more advanced. It's a little more, it's a little newer. Plus, the internal systems of the USS Ross have to be updated and newer because of all the plasma energy flowing through her systems because of two warp cores. Two. Um, <laughs> So this space is much more spacious, lots more consoles, a lot more engineering staff moving about and constantly maintenancing. It's not only that the USS Ross has two warp cores and is essentially two warp cores flying through space, but it's also all of that plasma energy and the fact that there's so many gravimetric disturbances in the Shackleton Expanse, constantly trying to chew apart the shield emitters of the ship, that this baby requires constant maintenance. She's a beautiful girl, but damn, she requires some maintenance. And so main engineering is always, always crowded with engineering staff moving about and keeping her tip top shape. As the three, as the four of you are centered around the center console, if you could imagine the camera cutting to the face of Lieutenant Vren doing this <laughs> as the two Vulcans are spitting out equations and sciences that make his brain melt out the side of his Andorian ears, he glances up at you Chief and just goes, I am useless here. I have no idea what anyone is saying. I think that last train of thought was close. Uh, it's just a little, little bit off the rails. <sighs> um, what you all have drafted up in front of you is what looks like a modified probe or actually, no, it'd be a torpedo. Right. A modified photon torpedo that's going to be using its warhead to cause the detonation, but is being modified for a certain energy signature. Um, the oh, what y'all have been working on. We, we would, we would, can, do you mind if we uh, talk through exactly what this thing can do? Please do. We have some ideas. Also, I want to know what your civilian clothes look like. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, Tavek, what do we look like? Uh, well, Tavek is wearing pr pretty much the same color I am, sort of a light-colored uh, tunic, uh, a lot of freedom of movement to do science-y things. Uh, uh, what, is, what is Stavik wearing? Uh, an almost identical uh, outfit, except in black. Uh, neither of us have uh, Starfleet pips. Uh, we both have small, uh, like, toolkits uh, of various kinds, um, but uh, Stavek seems to be the only one really using them. Uh, Tavek, uh, all of, like, literally, like, doesn't even need a, a notebook or anything. All of the math is done in her head. And also, they, they look, they look... Space, correct? Sorry, just as a quick, um, Jackson, he has yeah. a neural interface with the computer, correct? Yes, I, I I don't know how how blatantly obvious it is, um, but uh, if 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 you know if camera were to catch Stavek on like the back left or uh, back right side of his face, uh, sort of from his ear, his eye, his ear, and then down into his neck to his brainstem, uh, there is a uh, a bunch of sort of white metal uh, that's been uh, it's an implant, it's a neural implant, uh, sort of t tip top state of the art Daystrom Institute stuff. Uh, that's going down to a small port that uh, sits at the back of his head that's covered by the big wide uh, um, uh, collar that he's wearing. Okay. And they, they look very much alike. They could perhaps be twins because they, perhaps they are twins. Yeah, they could in fact be twins. twins. They are in fact twins, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Vulcan uh, twins. So, um, but yeah, so we're, ever since we came down here and we saw the, the basics of the probe, uh, the first thing Stavik did uh, was turn off the blueprints uh, and like completely wipe the uh, engineering uh, uh, hologram. Just program. clean, just, just swipe uh, it yeah. left. <laughs> uh, and, and, and and does this with um, a certain. He's never been to your main engineering, but he seems to be extremely uh, expert in the manipulation of holograms. And so he immediately starts to build a new hollow interface, um, mostly not speaking. Mostly it's his sister who's speaking, and he's doing the work. So he's like started sort of building it up and he goes, um, uh, sister, it would 
uh, Sister, it is re uh, readily apparent that even if we are to succeed in the uh, captain's initial mission of revealing the Romulan starship, we will still have a tactical situation on our hands. And unless the uh, experimental vessel seeks to get into some kind of combat scenario, we will need some manner of countermeasure there. A plan to back up our plan, if you will. Any thoughts? Uh, there is the obvious destruction of the Romulan vessel, but that uh, in the short term might serve the purposes. I feel longer term there may be a better use for it. Indeed, war is quite illogical, and in this particular case would also become problematic given the proximity to the Particle Fountain. Yes, the also Particle bad. Fountain itself... Oh, please continue, Chief Tech. Uh, uh, just not a result that we would like. Just wanted to throw that in there as a variable. <laughs> Continue. Quite correct. Uh, the Particle Fountain itself provides fascinating opportunities to perhaps, uh, if we do seek the destruction of the ship, to perhaps erase the existence that our involvement took place, uh, could perhaps be used as some sort of power source for whatever device that we send out. Two fascinating hypotheses, sister. One would, uh, the, let, let us follow these paths one by one. Uh, if we are to use the particle fountain as a power source upon explosion of the detonating probe, we would need a, uh, well, machine for it to power. That machine might operate as some manner of uh, scanner uh, elimination device, but, and then, he sort of turns to you, and again, the tiny, tiny smile pops up, and he goes, but as you know, everything is better when it is alive. This is something you say often, yes. <laughs> and so perhaps we apply this principle of sentience to the probe itself. And uh, at this point, uh, Stavik throws um, a, a small <laughs> holographic array uh, of his own onto the probe uh, uh, tabletop then deploying a new projection. Ideally, this projection looks like the probe that was initially there, but is now covered in a series of small circular arrays. Uh, if uh, uh, if you, you've never seen an array quite like this, um, but as he zooms in on them, you recognize them as portable holographic emitters, the same kind <laughs> that are the same kind that are built into the floors and ceilings of this entire vessel. Uh -huh. Let us perhaps say that we are to uh, achieve a certain uh, amount of infiltration of the Romulan vessel uh, given a scattershot explosion of small holographic emitters. 99.9% .9 of the emitters would be cast into space or destroyed by the probe. But if one were to intercept the flight path of the Romulan vessel, we might be able to download a small uh, copy, let's say, of the command consciousness of this vessel to the Romulan ship, thus commandeering it in a peaceful scenario that prevents us from having to have any manner of combat scenario with them. There may be something to this. We actually found earlier that it emits neutron radiation. That's how we were able to detect it when it cloaks and uncloaks. Uh, 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 GM correction. Oh. Um, just, just as a quick reminder, it was discovered that that was a red herring that oh. Admiral Mindyk was deliberately throwing at you guys is to make you think that there was a weakness to the cloaking device. Never mind. <laughs> uh, we this, saw through that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, this is why we build uh, a great deal of them onto the probe, uh, Chief Tech. Mm. You see, uh, as with a... Um, are you familiar with the principles of a shotgun? Hmm, yes. An ancient earth weapon designed to fire many small shards and thus hit a target with a greater degree of accuracy, but perhaps a smaller degree of damage. We I've have heard that some were used to fire hot dogs or potatoes. Or t or t-shirts, yes. We we will do something of the kind, except in this particular case, our hot dog t-shirt will be Commander XEO themselves. Oh. Wow. We can That's then a lot. We will then provide that consciousness to the Romulan vessel, providing an opportunity to commandeer Mendak's vessel, remove Mendak from the scenario in a peaceful uh, context, and perhaps prove to him once and for all the value of holographic life. After so all, Commander SEO <laughs> is the future of all Starfleet captaincy, and captaincy will be roughly, uh, un uh, will be, uh, 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 what is the word? Um, what Logical. Is the word? Something when it's, 
Yes, uh, yes, logical, but um, redundant. yes, uh, captaincy will be redundant within the next generation. Uh, let us teach the Romulans this. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I? Can I? Hit <laughs> brain raises his finger and just says, "Yes, so you, please." You, you, so we're we're, we're going to shoot Exio at it. That's <laughs> not the plan. We're a going portion to... of Exio, a copy of Exio, if you will, that can interface with the one on board the Ross. So you want to you want you want to construct a, a living thing. And, and turn it into a living sm smart bomb that will commandeer their ship? Hold on. Yeah. Wait, we might be actually onto something. I appreciate the suggestion, and it's not exactly the path that we were going down, but what if it weren't Exio that we were sending over, but a hologram of Sorex, who he would be expecting? Huh. I, that, I, could, that could, perchance, uh, provoke some sort of emotional reaction to guide them in the direction that we would like them to act. And at, at the very least, least get would, inside. and at the very least would act as a uh, mm. shocking deterrent for them. They would believe that they had completed their mission. If we send with a the understanding shuttle. that there is with the understanding that there are no holographic emitters on their vessel, we would my I sort of he like stops and thinks. And Stavik goes. My intention was not to project a visual representation of the commander on the Romulan vessel, but simply to inject their consciousness into the vessel and allow it to, well, do what we want. In order to project a stable and uh, viable hologram, we would need to find a way to move holographic emitters onto the Romulan vessel itself, which is perhaps more difficult. If by chance we project the image of this Romulan that they wish inside of some sort of module that they would bring aboard their own ship, that would solve that problem. But you'd have to construct something that would be able to fool this Romulan. Oh my god. Oh. Oh no, 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 no. No, no, I, I, just, I, I just got an idea. Just spit it out. I, I just got an idea. Don't we have a goose? We do. We I knew it was the goose. It's always the goose. I'm, I, I, I am sorry. What is a goose? There uh, is a glitch that has confounded me for weeks. There's a, a glitch in the matrix. There has been an. There has been a goose that's been randomly appearing and disappearing on, on board the Ross for weeks now, and we haven't actually been able to localize the anomaly and stop it from happening. But it's been hijacking Exio's emitters all over the decks. Then your premise in this particular case would be to insert said goose onto the Romulan vessel, causing their uh, systems to uh, glitch and uh, become go goosified. If you're going to smart bomb them using holographic technology, sure. This all, let me just point out, this all is completely dependent on us locating their ship first. Indeed. Well, the, the, the probe's natural aspect will be to do exactly this. Uh, the holographic emitter is simply a secondary action. One to make sure that we do not need to get into a combat scenario with said vessel, as I understand that that is a, uh, based on the briefing, that that is the objective of our commander. If we are to, if we are to create the probe primarily as a uh, device for detection, and then allow the probe itself to be the, the the payload delivery system. And then Tech he, again, just like a very small uh, smile. Tech and then you really could get their Romulan goose. <laughs> I, Brother. I, I love this. Take te uh, Tech takes Tevek aside and just says, uh, level with me. Is this the most logical course of action? <laughs> <laughs> and he's just looking right in your eyes. De make, constructing a plan dependent on an unknown and possibly untraceable anomaly within your own system might seem to be a problem, but delivering some sort of illogical simulation aboard their ship could work. That's all I needed. Sing, get the cat. <laughs> Sing, whose head pops down around the corner, he just says, 
Really? We're gonna do what they say. Uh, yes, Chief. And he goes, and Vren goes, oh my God, Lakat is gonna be so mad. She <laughs> is. She's gonna be so mad. She is. Stop, Vren, Stop Vren, it. I need you oh, to God. look at me, Vren. You have a yeah. very important task. I need you to find that goose. Vren to security. Be right back. <laughs> and he dashes out of main engineering. Stavek turns to Tavek and just in a in a sort of private moment, uh, turns back and goes, "Did I'm sorry? Did my ears deceive me, or did they just say that they were actually going to do what we suggested?" They are perhaps wiser than we gave them credit for. I really I believe that I would have to take this all the way to the top. <laughs> I am impressed. At that I mean, moment yeah. is when Commander Exio is chirped up to the bridge by Lieutenant Vren. The goose? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, it sounds wild, but they're going to use Say a portable home. no more. I want that goose off my ship, and I will agree to any action in which that is done. We might need your help since you have more access to the hollow emitters on board the ship anywhere to help us localize it. But if we can get a hold of it, we can do what what he's suggesting. After we locate the ship, we can literally beam over a goosey smart bomb to temporarily hijack systems on board the ship. Theoretically, but it's pretty sound and he's kind of a genius. I would love to meet them. Excellent. Um, I'll let you know. I've got a security team with a couple of engineers here with me. Um, I'll get your help on this uh, and let you know how it turns out. Vren out. Thank you. Vren in the turbo lift with a bunch of ox crew behind him just looks back at them and just goes, well, Kat's going to hate that she missed this. <laughs> Are you ready for your extended tasks? So, yeah. unlike throwing this all on a single player, because this is not just Chief Tech doing this. This yeah. is Chief Tech. This is Vren and the security teams. This is Exios assisting with that, and the two Vulcan twins down there. Um, and can, can, can I get uh, one? I, I know I know Exio shushed it off, because she's down. But what? What? OK, so. Just a quick, what is being made? Yeah. A, a, a hologram bomb that is, it's not looking like Sorex. It is just a it's hologram a, it's virus, virus being so made. The, the, the hologram the virus has been storming the rocks. Yeah. It is the glitch that has been storming the, the, that was last seen in the main phaser array of the USS Ross. The, the premise, the, the premise is effectively that we will take the probe that we were already planning on shooting out there, that itself yeah. going to explode just by nature of the plan. Yeah. And then rather than allowing, rather than just letting it explode, we're first going to jettison off basically a 360 degree radius of holographic emitters. Most of those holographic emitters will be destroyed. Um, one of those holographic emitters ideally will hit, and then whatever that is will inject the code into the Romulan vessel's computer systems, hijacking right. their computer systems with the goose. So effectively right. you'll be able to see the Romulan vessel, and you'll be able to know that the Romulan vessel is infected by the goose. That, okay, great. That is my other question. Eric, mm -hmm. was it confirmed that this was a double cloaked vessel and that it was both uh, like aesthetically cloaked as well as technologically? So right now it's it's more difficult to detect than normal because of the tetrium D, uh, the tilium D deposits that are uh, tilium. I'm thinking about Star Galactic now um, <laughs> because because of the deposits that are located on the hull that protect it from the subspace anomalies. It is a little more difficult to detect um, with standard sensors. Plus, it has a perfect Romulan cloak based off of the technology that was enhanced through Riemann technology that was previously used on the, on the scimitar during the uprising. However, theoretically, the disruption caused by detonating something close to the particle fountain should actually nullify these advantages completely. Great, send out a big honk. I'm into it. Let's do this. <laughs> 
I'll roll for the Pedo. rocks. Honk, 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 honk. <laughs> This is going to be one of the nastiest extended tasks I've thrown at you. Not only because you are looking at taking down the big bad, right? but you're trying to accomplish two tasks at once. And you have a time limit. So here we go. Here it is. Get ready to write down your stats here um, and, and track this as best you can. Yep. And for those of you who do not know extended tasks, don't worry. We're going to walk you through it. <clears throat> All right. The difficulty of what you're attempting to do is going to be five, <laughs> which is on an extended roll, murder. Mm -hmm. Magnitude oh. is going to be five, which on an extended roll is murder. Mm -hmm. The resistance is only one. Okay. Bird murder or murder murder? <laughs> uh, just like this, this is some of this is some of the worst I could throw at you for an extended task. This is about as high as it goes. Good. The work track on this is 20. But to make things a super bitch, oh. it is a timed task because you have two hours to complete this. Right. Now, I'm not going to penalize you. I'm going to start this at two hours instead of taking away any time limit that was started when this whole scenario began. However, the intervals you guys are basically going to have... 10 intervals. This is going to be tough. One interval counts for 12 minutes. Okay. So 10 intervals, 120 minutes. You got two hours to complete this. Okay. We got this. Now you literally have some of the most brilliant minds in Starfleet working on this. How much momentum do you guys have? Three. I have. Okay. That's a good start. Yeah. This is a this is one of the most difficult extended tasks I have ever thrown at you guys. I've never thrown a difficulty five magnitude five extended tasks at you. So, love it. And it's remember, a the goal is breakthroughs, right? Because as is as wonderful it is is getting that work track down to zero because then you get auto breakthroughs. Getting breakthroughs. Think of the magnitude of an extended task as the hit points. You want to get that. <laughs> However, in order to succeed on each on each roll, you're going to need to hit five difficulty, which is not cool. What? So uh, help me understand this as somebody who's sure. just never done an extended task. Yeah. So in order to get so in order to knock off points on that work track and to roll on your on and to roll your two dice plus your rating. Mm -hmm. that you need to knock down work on the track. You need to roll five successes every time I tell you to roll. Got it. And that's five successes combined between all three of us rolling? That's or correct. So the yeah. odds are actually quite good considering because all three of you are brilliant at this. But it's not just you rolling. Exio is also going to be making rolls. Everyone's going to be contributing to this because... Okay. This I'll, be, is to, I'll but, be rolling but, for the Ross. Right. Mm -hmm. and But the leader of the role is being passed around. So it's not going to be always you guys. Okay, so great. It's yeah. going to go from each one of you. So, um, I, I just just to throw this out here really fast because I don't know necessarily how this plays into it. So I'm just going to okay. throw it out early. Um, when uh, I, I have a quality called Lab Rat, uh, right. Lab Rat uh, says that I prefer to spend most of my time uh, engaged in various side projects and experiments in the ship's labs. And because of this, uh, when attempting an extended task using a laboratory, which I assume we are since we'd be using our holographics in AI lab, um, that uh, the, pro the character gains the progression one effect. Ah. I don't know what that means in regard to this, but I'm hoping that can help us out a little bit. It's 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 good. It basically means you add one to the work track. You're going to progress one in the work track. It's super helpful because it helps you burn through the work track even faster. Got it. Awesome. The only the only indicate you have to score successes though. Now yeah. I am going to permit success at cost, which means you guys can make the roll. Even if you fail it, I can let you succeed at cost, which means you move forward and roll your dice, but you don't get to spend momentum and I get to get a complication in there. Cool. Love it. So. Awesome. We're going to start with Chief Tech. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> so every role for this right now, uh, I should say every role for Chief Tech, this is going to be an engineering, um, actually, you know, on tech, this is going to be uh, engines and engineering role. Engines? For, oh, I'm sorry, not engines. Uh, 
computers engine engineering role for the Ross. Okay. And for tech, this is going to be a control engineering check. Great. Um, I uh, have a uh, obviously my my neural interface. Um, mm -hmm. So when uh, it, and this only this, I'm saying this because this affects normally whoever is running the computers check for the ship, not just me. Yeah. Uh, initiating. Let me see. Sorry. Um, when they are connected, uh, they may re-roll d20 gain from using the ship systems. Uh, however, anytime the ship suffers a breach, I will suffer three uh, CD of stress. Right, because you're connected. Yeah. So while I'm connected, does that mean that uh, that tech can re-roll his d20 or only me? Only you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yep. Understood. So when it comes to your turn on this, you can totally activate that. Understood. Thank you. Um, but on this, uh, either you or Jody can assist. You want to assist, Jody? Um, this is we, an I, engineering check. Yeah, we. You, you're better at engineering, but I'm no, 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 no. Oh. This is this is Chief Tech's role, so he's actually covering the engineering part. You would be covering okay. the science part. Oh, oh okay. So for you, uh, it would be reason I'll, science. You should do I'll it, do, Jody. Yeah, I'll do that then. Okay, then you roll one die instead of two because you're assisting. And you, on your successes only count if Chief Tech succeeds. He needs five successes. And what's the and what's the success threshold? It's whatever your combined attribute plus discipline is. Understood. And Chief Tech, I'm pretty sure you have a discipline that's going to apply here. I do, but it's only uh, after I succeed. So I'm going to spend one momentum to okay. buy an extra die. So we're down okay. to two. Uh, and. Yeah, I do. I have in the nick of time, which means that for oh, every, sweet. I get plus one work on every effect. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So this is control oh. engineering. Okay. Ooh, floor dice. Floor oh, dice. No. I'm going to grab another one. Okay. We've got three, three, three successes. All right, Jody, make your roll. Okay. And sorry, was this uh, reason science or? Uh huh. And oh. what are your focuses? Uh, my focus is quantum physics, energy and particle physics, artificial okay, intelligence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how do focuses yes. go into that? Is that that's just so you can get the second success if it's lower than the discipline? So yeah, if you roll roll a d20 and if it's the same number of your discipline or lower, you just got a critical hit. Okay, About yeah, it's lower. Would my focus of Did subspace you get theory apply? What's that? My focus of subspace theory? Would that yes, this, theory? you're literally using subspace to manipulate Absolutely. So four? Four. What'd you get? Oh, no, it's just a success. Sorry. Yeah, Once that's five, you hit the threshold. You get five <gasps> successes. Okay. Okay. You hit the threshold on your first. Yeah. So this R is going to be no one help. interval of time. Well, I I believe that we're, we're going to have to pay one for piercing in order to meet that, right? That's correct. Yeah. So we're down to one momentum. Um, <clears throat> but then I'm going to roll my effects. All right. Two, three, four. Ooh, okay. So I'm going to, I I don't think, I don't get to reroll for this one quite yet. So uh, I've got two, four, six successes total. Ooh. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Six, um, and that's plus four. Uh, uh, so 10 total. Uh, and two of those are effects. 10 total? Mm. So it's half the work track. <laughs> two effects but in the nick of time Xander, your expertise Xander, every time you roll five or more on the work track Break it's through. a breakthrough yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's two does that two so you you kill five on the work track you got ten successes uh, ten yeah on the, the effect dice two of those are effects Okay, so you can use one of those effects so that this only, yeah. Can Great. I forward this for pay, paying for piercing for the next round? Uh huh. Instead uh, of paying momentum? No, you would just get, you would just, yeah, unfortunately. I just thought I'd ask. You, you can't bank <laughs> that. Um, oh my God. So the magnitude drops from five to three. Hell yeah. <laughs> Wahoo! <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. You were down to 10 on the work track. Yeah. Um, and that's going to knock off one interval of time. Out of our 10 <laughs> intervals? Yeah. 
Hell yeah! Awesome. Wow, that was a monster roll to start Give this off. All right, we're supposed to go on break here, but I think if you guys are down, let's finish this roll. What do you guys think? Sure, Just do yeah. the task before we head to break. Yeah, let's do it. Jeez, I, I, I was like, I gotta throw a heavy one at them because they just burn through extended tasks like nothing. I love it. And here we are. Surround right. yourself with people that make you look impressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave we, we do only have the one momentum right now. I right. Like, yes. Oh, you know what, though? I just remembered you actually burn through two intervals of time right. every time you attempt a task, unless you use one of those effects, I believe, to and we did. Uh, have the time. Got it. So okay. two intervals. You burn through one interval. So that took you 12 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> We're down to eight Most intervals. All right, so let me tell you this. As you guys are working, I will say this to the twin Vulcans that are watching this Bolian work. He is a genius at his trade. The, the, the simplistic mechanical brilliance that's going into the design and like shifting around to the holograms. He's sort of finishing your sentences as you're coming up with concepts. The Bolian's like, oh yeah, that could work. And it's just kind of like this sort of sort of just like simple, humble, just like, yeah, yeah. And just like this creative excitement that starts brewing up in tech as he starts moving around. At, at one point, Singh is watching just kind of like dizzied by the, the maneuvers that are going on between the brilliant minds at this table as y'all are constructing this thing. Um, Jackson, I'm gonna have you roll now. Awesome, uh, is, it, is it feasible to, so when, uh, uh, sorry, I am better if Jody has rolled before me, uh, is there, it, does Tavex uh, assist on the previous roll allow me to utilize testing a theory? Oh, that's um. I don't think you can use testing a theory if you're assisting. I think you have to be the leader of that role. Right. So, so you, I was, I was wondering, could could Tavex roll next and then I roll? Um. Well, the, so here's my thoughts on it: is that sure. the two of you would be rolling as a unit. But if you want to roll separately, oh. we can totally do that. Yeah, sorry, it's just part of my build is that Tavek does the thing and then I do the thing. Um, okay, cool. I, my character so doesn't work as well. Jody next awesome. you hand it off to Jody. All, All right. right. Which kind of makes sense because basically, just from a just from like a story perspective, right? Uh, totally. Tech just, tech just built the probe. Yeah. Which was like like I I like threw his probe away and he built a whole new probe. <laughs> like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, yeah. Starting from impressive. scratch, basically. All right, right. In that case, Jody, I'm going to have the USS Ross roll computers plus science. And Jody, you're going to roll reason science, and your specialties are going to kick in here. All right. Uh, we only have one momentum, though, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I, do, I do have it's cautious science. Tough. I have cautious science, but that takes momentum. So it, I, no, I no. think it's better to take it for cautious than for piercing afterwards because then you get an extra die. Yeah, and you get a free reroll. So I would and say burn that momentum. Yep. And, is the, okay. and, is, and the ship is doing the assisting on this roll? Is that right? Yes, and also, okay. Jody, you can call on one of your values if you want. Oh, yes. Um, since we are looking at perhaps utilizing the uh, particle fountain as something of a power source for this probe, I'm going to use all science starts with the theoretical. Okay. Oh. So you, I'll let, I'll allow that. Yes. Uh, I'll, then you automatically start with a critical success. So you're at two successes. Two. So you're gonna roll your two dice, and mm -hmm. then um, Jackson, you're gonna assist on this. Three dice. Oh yeah. Three oh, dice because I spent on. the momentum. Yeah. So I, so and then I, that means I roll one dice, and that's against my what? You're gonna be using your control engineering. Thank you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh, I. They all succeed, but okay. yeah, so it's just three successes. Just three successes. I, on yeah. Three I rolled a yeah. two, whatever that means. A two for you, that's going to be a critical success. Hey, hey awesome. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I rolled an 11, a 13, and a 17, but that's all under the target. So nice. Oh, 17 would, yeah, 17 is not going to count. But what was the other one? Oh, because it, it, oh, it has to be under and not tie. Uh, is your is your total skill 17? Yep. Science Never and reason is 17. Okay. <laughs> so three, four, five, and then Jackson got two. So that's a total of eight. So gain wow. some momentum. Gain three momentum. <laughs> now, Xander, would you mind telling her what she's going to roll on those six-sided dice? Yes. So you're going to look for, uh, what was the your check? I, I mean, I have, the, I have the Trek ones. Yeah, so. perfect. 
So your your science is what you use there, right? So whatever your yes. science score, that's the amount of the d6s that you're going to roll. Oh, then I need more d6s. Hopefully I have some. You can also, like, double roll if you want. Okay. Just keep track of. Okay, so... I, what, what, what do these mean? Yes, so if there are, like, the starburst uh, sort of effects, there's uh, either a one or a two. Those are, like, the points. So this counts as one, this counts as two. The Starfleet symbol counts as one, but it's a special effect. So something else also happens. You just explained okay. it the way half. <laughs> so, so I think that's, and a one on a regular D6 is just a one on the equivalent yeah. of the challenge dice. So that's so. one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five with an effect. Um, so you might want to spin that momentum for the resistance so you get the piercing. Yeah. Okay, I will take your um, word for that. So we yeah, so burn more. that momentum. So how many successes total? Uh, sorry, what was that again? Six. What was the What was the total number again? Five. Yeah, I got five. With five. One, two, three, there. four, five. That's another breakthrough. The magnitude drops down to two. <laughs> awesome. And work tracks down to five. <laughs> okay. And that, that's uh, gonna knock off two intervals. Awesome. All right. Well, with the theory done, the uh, holographic and AI engineering is ready to go. The probe is built. The power source is done, and so now um, Stavek is going to, uh, with ideally um, the uh, aid of uh, his sister, uh, build a uh, build the hollow emitter shotgun array. Uh, the T-shirt <laughs> cannon. Pro project, so this is the attachment. Project, so project T-shirt cannon. Is, so the Ross is going to roll. This is going to be computers engineering for the Ross. Okay. Uh, somebody's rolling the Ross for me. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And awesome. who wants to assist? Uh, actually, you know who's probably going to assist here is Exio. Because Exio nice. is currently coordinating with the security team to get you that hollow goose that you need uh, to nice. install. So this is going to determine whether or not you guys succeed in that. Um, so for you, Jackson, I'm going to have you roll uh, your control engineering check. Great. I'm going to, um, my, my, I have a focus in hollow technology. Yes. Uh, so, I like, so what what does that focus do? By the way, Lenny came to say hello. It basically hello. means that your engineering score is now your critical range. Hi, cat. Nice. Hello, engineering cat. score is my is my range. I love it. Hello, cat. Spot. She, Hi, yeah. Spot. Spot just here now. Or grudge. We have two Star Trek cats now. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, okay. Okay. So, how many D twenty am I rolling on this? I'm sorry. I'm still. You're rolling two. Head around. Unless this. you spend momentum to buy more, you're rolling two. Uh, how much momentum we got, y'all? We have two momentum. Um, do you have the talent Cautious Engineering? Uh, no. no. That's bold engineering. Bold. Uh, so you uh, give threat instead of us. Would you like to reward me threat and get a die? Yes. Excellent. Um, also, uh, I've got uh, a thing called testing a theory, uh, which means that when tempting in a task with uh, engineering or science, I may roll one additional d20 as long as my sister has succeeded at a previous task in the same field. Which she just did. Yep. Uh, and then I've got uh, something called unconventional thinking. Uh, if the hypothesis being pursued is considered outside of the box, the difficulty of the tasks is reduced by one. Oh, dang. Okay, so I'll drop the difficulty down to four. Amazing. Nice. Okay. How would you like me to be assisting? <laughs> okay, I'm so good. Gina. <laughs> yes. Exio is going to roll daring plus command. Daring command? Oh, yep. snap. That's not great, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, I would like to request... It, it was It's Syvek, correct? Uh, Stavek. Stavek. Forgive me, Stavek. I would like to request that the computer witnesses the virus taking place by Exio releasing the goose. Just, that's my suggestion. Um, and I would like to use my hollow artist focus to have that image be possible just to the computer. I, I, I uh, for okay. the first time, that tiny smile becomes a full face wide smile in engineering, which obviously like Exio probably doesn't see, but anyone around Stavek, he looks crazy. When, when that like when that shows up, he, he just he like kind of laughs to himself and goes like, oh yes. Yep. Oh yes. 
Y'all aren't just trying to take down Mindak, you're trying to pants him. Tebek, yeah, Te Tebek, do you recall when I suggested that captaincy would be irrelevant within the next generation? Yes, you say that often. I would like to revise that statement. Captaincy is hereby irrelevant. Because of Goose? Because of XEO. And, all right. Okay, so. <laughs> um, well said, well said, Joni. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, okay, and, so the, and, and then the, the threshold for success here is my control plus my engineering or science? Uh, it's gonna be your control plus engineering. Okay, so that's 16. So I'm under threshold on all four dice and I crit on, and my, and my crit is my engineering rating, right? Your engineering or lower, yes. Got it, so I crit on one. We, you, you crit on your engineering or lower. Yes, so I crit yeah. on I, I, so I crit on one of my four dice and I oh. hit all four. So it's four successes, five, it's five successes. Okay. Plus a natural one from the Ross. Ooh. So five, six, seven. What'd you get, Gina? Two. Two? Nine. Is nine our max? Have we ever had nine successes? I, think I feel like have... eight is our cap. Maybe once, but either way, nine is like the highest. I'm it's amazing. Sure. All right, so max out your momentum pool. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're going to roll dice. All right. So um, how many D6s am I rolling on this? You're going to take Jesus your engineering Christ. score, yep. and that's the amount. Got it. And I'm looking for, if I, if I don't have the special dice, what numbers am I looking for? That's a good question. Is it uh, ones and twos, fives and sixes? Thank you. Threes and fours do not count for anything. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I got uh, two sixes, a five, and a one. Okay, so fives and sixes count as ones, but with a special effect. Okay. Four so that's total. one, two, three, four successes total uh, with uh, three effects. Three. Which you can add that to the work track instead. And then you also have that one that gives you one extra work, right? That was great. I think he had one too. No, uh, he has one. He has one as well. Do I? The laboratories. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. The progression one effect. Yeah. Okay. You, you guys, you, you beat it by mag. It was the magnitude was two, and you basically just crushed magnitude three. <laughs> <laughs> so twenty four, twenty two, forty two. So in about an hour, you complete the project. Yes. <gasps> if you can't imagine all of these brilliant minds down in main engineering, and the friend. stress of what you're attempting to do bleeds away and it becomes a symphony of creativity and ideas the pressure of this romulan ship and the lives at stake all just kind of becomes background noise because the confidence in knowing that all of you are onto something something wild that's never been done before channeling the energy of a particle fountain into a detonator that can unmask cloaked vessels as well as insert a logic bomb in the shape of a holographic goose uh into a Romulan starship that can wreak havoc and temporarily disable it. Like the multi-layer effect of which the, the mad minds putting together that are coming up with is incredible. And towards the end of the project, when you guys seal up this torpedo and lock it, try to also picture that in the process of putting this all together, part of the success is Commander Exio throwing herself through the air of the um, as she's teleporting through the hollow matrix and tackling a holographic goose to the ground. Finally catching it and just body tackling this thing to the ground and actually using her hollow matrix to lock it down. Y'all are able to transfer this glitch down into the portable matrix that you've installed inside of this torpedo. And by the time you are done, you lock the torpedo up and it's good to go. Vryn is looking at all of you just going, I, if this works, if this works, we're gonna be legends, you guys. <laughs> uh, Tech just looks at the twins and just goes, where have you been all my life? <laughs> Mostly in our lab. Oh. There was a very large lock on that door. Yes, and you're gonna take a 10 minute break. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna take a 10 minute break. We'll be back in 10 minutes for what I'm, a, what I'm guessing is going to be one of the most memorable scenes in my time playing Star Trek Adventures. <laughs> Don't go anywhere, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Uh. 
Welcome back, everybody, to Clear Skies. Uh, we're about to engage in some, some tomfoolery. Where we left off, you guys had completed this torpedo, and um, <laughs> this torpedo, which is going to function as a bomb that draws upon the power of a particle fountain, which is one of the most dangerous spatial anomalies that Starfleet has ever encountered in its time exploring deep space, and showering the open space with particle or i'm sorry holograph holographic projectors that are meant to interact with the systems inside of a romulan vessel and thus project a large angry goose that will cause pure havoc um <laughs> and what could possibly go wrong <laughs> uh i you know considering the absurdity and not only just the absurdity but also the amount that you all wanted to complete with this single device I threw one of the most absurdly difficult extended tasks I had at you, and um, you calmly sat that extended task down at the table and explained why it needs to shut up. <laughs> and so it did. Uh, so, um, Gina, you missed it uh, because your computer was like, hey, cool, I know you're playing a game, but I'm going to update now, so peace out. <laughs> First it froze, and then I had to start it over, and then it went, great, you started over. Time to update. <laughs> well, since we're doing this, um, you missed the descriptor of Gene of Exio's contribution while everyone was doing the science. Exio uh, maneuvering through the hollow emitters uh, during into the main phaser array control center where the goose was last detected and Exio hurtling herself through the air and full on body tackling the goose and binding its matrix. You finally caught the goose, which I'm going to say the ox crew has probably been pacing bets on who's going to finally get the goose. So ox crew. Who, who had the pool? That was me. Yeah. Whoever was voting Exio, which was the safe bet because they're the holo they're the emitter writer. Um, there you go. <laughs> it was Exio. So this torpedo is ready to go. This took about one hour. By Mindak's own timing, you have a full hour still <laughs> sitting here. But this thing is ready to go. Um, the, Desha particle, the particle observer station has reached out to the Ross a few times just for updates. They are sitting tight. Yugos has told you that his team is very nervous. They don't know the enemy that they're dealing with. It doesn't seem like the Tholians, you reasoned with the Tholians, you bargained with the Tholians, one of the most difficult races to have any kind of diplomatic negotiation with. You managed to bargain with Tholians, but you also helped protect their god, supposedly. So, Still my proudest <laughs> moment. You had an ace up your sleeve. Romulans, however, just want one thing and you're not giving it to them. They don't know the nature of what they're up against. But because of this new situation, they've grown, you can feel their anxiety, Olin, on the, on the station. The Dishashians are very nervous. Um, we are now at the scene where everyone is resuming their place on the bridge and Asmi Shanto walks down the ramp and approaches and stands in front of the center chair and says, Okay, um, Commander, I, I have something, but I don't know. You're going to like it very much. Then say it quickly. The law is incredibly opaque. When it comes to extraditing criminals across interstellar law, it's kind of just who outplays who. Uh, there's really no statute at this point. The last time there was a situation like this was actually during the Kinemer uh, incident when James T. Kirk was taken by the Klingons and sentenced to, to prison. Uh... There were plans to extradite him then, and the Federation backed away from it, apparently. So you're saying the winner is above the law? The winner is whoever bluffs the hardest, sir. Excellent. Then let's bluff. Yes, sir. She goes right back to her station and sits down and murmurs under her breath, the cat's going to hate that she missed this. Um, <clears throat> what do you do, Commander? Well, we've still got an hour, correct? Yeah. Um, there was a call being made to Narendra Station, uh, Narendra Station by, uh, yeah, I would love the, the, the ambassador to, to get a call onto the Romulan Empire to alert that we are under attack. Okay. Um, put in those calls so that this paper trail is in our favor. 
Okay. Yeah. Good call. Um, all right. We're going to have the Ross roll communications and security. And I'm going to roll, actually, this NPC, our security officer, Rogers, created by one Kato, one of our elder mods. They are going to also make the roll here. I'm going to say this is going to be a control security check on their part. Um, no, maybe. Uh, yeah. I'm actually in, in the diplomatic suites now doing this call, so I think that's going to come into play. Do you? Uh, this is to establish a secure connection. So this well, is literally encrypting. This is encrypting the channel, so that Mindak does not catch on that you guys are doing this. Okay. Yeah. But if somebody wants to assist, you're more than welcome to. If you can, if you can rationalize how it is you're helping encrypt this call. Otherwise, I'm just going to um, roll. I did assign an, a security officer to do just this. So. Oh, is that right? Okay, that's right. Okay. Yeah, next June uh, Robinson. Yes, no, no, that's no. right. So for what it's worth, aren't, uh, aren't we both freely? You could use the geniuses. No, I mean, technically, it, technically no. that's still happening as this oh, is. Oh, okay. Got 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 Sorry. Okay, no problem. Because the crew of the Ross is not to be messed with. Okay. All right. So I'm going to roll this. Uh, so go ahead and if you could roll for the Ross for me. This is going to be a contested roll. I'm going to spend threat for Mindak. We do have a ton of momentum, too. You have a ton. You have a full pool of momentum. Then let's go ahead and have all our NPCs uh, <laughs> spend. spend okay. uh, yeah. Let's go ahead and give Gerson and, and, and Robinson all the help they can get. So, um, and then, so that's two spend. Are you also using one? I'm not rolling. Oh. I just rolled. Oh. And in, in the Ross, whoever's rolling for the Ross. I did, and no successes. Okay, I rolled two successes, but I rolled a 20 on one of the die. We can burn momentum to get rid of that complication, can't we? Yeah. Let's yep. do that. Okay, so we're down to two momentum. Okay. So the security officer next to you, um, this is Lieutenant Robinson. You see her, she is coordinating with Lieutenant Rogers on the bridge. The two of them are working in tandem as they manage to set a secure channel. As you see the secure channel activate and the connection being made to Narendra Station, the first thing that happens is the Lieutenant turns to you, Olin, and just says, you're not gonna have a very long window, so you'll have to probably make this quick, otherwise the Romans are gonna detect that we're communicating. Good luck, Ambassador. Understood. Ambassador Pagino, we find ourselves in a very dire situation and we could use your help. I understand that I already owe you a favor and I think that with your help, I will likely owe you another. And I understand that our next conversation will not be easy. And so I am asking you in my most serious tone that you give us the uh, tools we need to, well, stave off an attack from Admiral Mendak, who is currently in violation of our treaty. Message sent. If it got through and everything proceeded as normal, Ambassador, we should have a reply theoretically in the next 10, 15 minutes. Don't see any reason to uh, keep anything from the Ambassador. He might as well know exactly what it is we're up against. Those minutes stretch on and on and on <clears throat> outside the beautiful glass sliding doors, with the Federation logo upon it. You can see the hollow fountain. You can see some of the hollow birds taking perches in the trees. The shutters, however, on the promenade deck have been closed because of yellow alert. And uh, there is nobody currently on the promenade deck, save for just like a few of the merchant areas where uh, people are closing up their spots, their like shops and whatnot. And time stretches on and it just starts to wear for a minute. The Lieutenant is just kind of like wrapping her fingers on the table when all of a sudden you see incoming transmission appear on the screen. She says, all right, here we go. 
Incoming message. Coming up on the screen, you see Ambassador Pagino's face. And he looks quite serious. And he says, Ambassador, that was a rather startling message to receive. I apologize for not uh, being a, a little more delicate. Unfortunately, we are a little bit under the gun here. And I wanted to make sure you had the most important aspects of what is happening here as quickly as possible. There's a frustrating chat delay as he's listening to you respond. Uh, this distance with no subspace uh, transceivers to actually bounce signals back, it's taking the Ross a little bit. So you see you see the lieutenant shaking her head as she's monitoring the window that you guys have to talk. Pagino nods as he's listening and listening and then says, there's not much I can do for you to be perfectly honest, Ambassador. Admiral Mindak has kind of, how should I say this? He's gone off the grid a little bit. No one's entirely sure whose side he's on right now. It was assumed he was a Sila loyalist, and he has since taken, from what I understand, a very valuable piece of arm uh, armament from the Romulan Navy and has vanished. If you've encountered him, then he's not acting on behalf of the Romulan Star Empire. You don't need to say another word. You have given me exactly what I need, Ambassador Bugino. Thank you so very much. As the chat delay finishes up, you see she looks at you with this worried look in her eyes like you're coming to the end of the window, and he just says, be careful, Ambassador. If he's acting on his own volition, it means he'll do whatever he feels is necessary. Mindak is one of our mightiest warriors and not to be trifled with. Understood. I will see you soon, Ambassador Pagino. And you're, the transmission cuts off and she says, I'm sorry, Ambassador. No, you, we, you don't need to apologize. I didn't really have much more to say to him. <clears throat> but that, that is perfect. <laughs> and uh, Olin, like already out the door, like headed towards the turbo lift, taps on their communicator, communicator. Commander, I have excellent news for you. Um, and is on their way up to the bridge. And okay. as they are, they're like just debriefing the commander as as they're like heading up. And of course, they're they're bringing the the security people with them. Olin steps off the turbo lift with a few of the secure with uh, the lieutenant in tow. Steps down onto the bridge. Um, Exio's already sort of like facing uh, where they know that they will be entering, sort of like okay, like a turn. like. Yeah, like uh, you, you, when a parent knows you're coming home for the night, or, you know, it's like, ah, it's sort of like, welcome. <laughs> so there's, so there's good and bad to this. The good is that he is 100% in violation of our treaty, which puts him at a disadvantage. That being said, because he has gone rogue, he has little less to lose than he had before. So we also have to contend with that. But still, Ambassador Regino now knows what's going on, which means we have somebody who can relay back to the Romulan Star Empire what is going on. I think it would be a rather nice present for your ambassador if we were able to return a stolen vessel to the Romulan Star Empire. Don't you agree, Ambassador, that that, that might work as a nice favor? I think, considering what we're in for when I get back to Narendra, this might be exactly the ace in the hole that we needed. Hmm. And I couldn't be more grateful for it. Shall we release the honk? Oh. <laughs> oh, let's please. Um, in the hour, I, I'd like to just point out here that in the hour, after, because if we had two hours to finish this thing, and we yeah, there's plenty hour, of time. Yes, we, if we finish it an hour early, guaranteed, Stavik. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, Stavik, uh, along with whatever software he uploads to the probe, uplo uploads a um, uh, an official request through the like. He like hacks the Starfleet chain of command comms because he doesn't have access to that because he's not an officer um, to send a request uh, or ideally put a meeting on the captain's schedule or on Exio's schedule uh, to meet the commanding officer. 
for him and Tanek. So you want to you want to put in a request to meet Exio? I would. Um, ideally, I'd love to do it in a Stavekian way. Insofar as I don't say like, so the, "Oh, I'm going to do it," I just. The funny thing is, is in, in as you get into the computers of the Ross and you open up the database and access the boards, you realize that Exio has a request form for anybody who wants to meet her, um, and an open counseling session as well. Because oh, wow. when she's not in command, when she's off duty, she is the head counselor of the ship. Oh. <laughs> So you you do have access to that, and you could send that along. Yeah, I I I do, but effectively make it like priority. <laughs> okay. Exio, as you're sitting in the chair and you're finishing up this conversation with the ambassador, you <laughs> you immediately get a notification on your console command on the chair. It's marked priority. Priority message coming through the console command of the chair are only for like security issues or mm -hmm. damage reports or anything that is genuinely a priority for the captain of the vessel to need to know about. And when you tap it and the screen opens up, you see it's a request form for a meeting from one of the did Vulcans it, who helped build that torpedo. Did it come through counseling uh, schedule? Yes, it has, the, it, has the, it has the Starfleet medical logo on it and everything. It went right through the counseling. It looks like he basically flagged his own thing as a priority message and sent it through the, the council request, counseling request form. Uh, and, uh, ideally, uh, when you open it, rather than opening like a normal request form, it produces a small hologram, like a small hologram, a smallogram of um, <laughs> of Stavik and Tavek, uh, and it just goes, "Greetings, my name is Stavik. This is my uh, twin sister, Tavek." Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. I can introduce. I can introduce myself, brother. Uh, I am Tavek. Apology. Yes. Well, anyway, we are admirers and would very much like to meet you. Behind okay. you, XEO, you hear the lieutenant current acting chief of security has spotted this hollow emitter and goes, what the hell? They just look I, down at it with this shocked look on their face. I just uh, do a quick aside to the ambassador and I say, I believe I've just received my first fan mail. <laughs> well, at least via text or in this case, communicate. I believe many people just by way of speaking to you are giving you fan mail. I'm a fan. Well, I better go answer this priority meeting. <laughs> uh, and do you want me in the meantime to contact Mundak and tell him that he is, um, <clears throat> to put it in a very uh, Starfleet way, fucked? I would say hold off. I would very much like to be there when his face changes. Of course. I'll I'll just hang out here with patience then. I'm sure this will only be a moment. We do have a clock ticking. Hmm. Okay. And I blip to where they are since I do know. <laughs> so in your laboratory, as the two of you have returned, um, after you send this message, you look up almost like you're about to say something to your sister when Exio appears in the hollow emitters in your lab. Uh, I, I'm sitting, uh, I stand up and kind of stumble to my feet as if like, you know, like if Chris Evans like appeared in my, in my living room. <laughs> uh, like, I, it just sort of like, I, I just sort of like stumble, stumble backwards and like look a little flustered for a second uh, and like, <clears throat> okay. greetings. And, and I stand. I stand up like this has not bothered me at all in the least, and give a nod, perfectly attuned to your rank at the moment. It's it's Greetings. night and day, Gina. Um, Exio is seeing a Vulcan that is behaving like a Vulcan, and the other one is yeah. behaving like that one. <laughs> uh, I can see on your extremely effective and impressive emotional array uh, that you are uh, concerned by my behavior. Uh, I understand that in uh, non-Vulcan, or I, I understand that in uh, non-Vulcan societies, it is uh, customary to apologize 
but I hope you will accept that I will not. This is my sister, Tevek. I am Stavek. It is good to officially meet you in person. I would like to thank you for your good work so far today. It is yep. our pleasure to be able to assist the Ross, which has been a very suitable laboratory for us for quite some time now. I'm glad to hear it. And uh, at this point, Stavik has just sort of started circling uh, and like is just really admiring the hell out of you. Oh gosh! Like not like in like not like in like a creepy way. Just to, no, no, no. But like, just, like an artist like, is like walking around a model that he's getting ready to draw, kind of. Uh, way. Or, yeah, or like an artist who's or like like uh, like an artist who's walking around another artist. Like it's it's not it's not like oh you're an amazing pro. You're not objectifying. Ex yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. the point. The point here is more like it's just kind of an amazing thing to see. Um, um for, while for while you're while you're doing that, um. Uh, Exio just sort of without moving she's quite used to this um, <laughs> and just sort of says um, you know the first time I met Chief Tech he did the exact same thing please forgive my brother for his emotional outburst yes there is I... no need to apologize I can tell the difference when someone is eyeing me up as a thing rather than a person I appreciate when it is looked upon with respect. Are you aware, I wonder, of the circumstances under which Tevek and I received the Daystrom Prize? I am not aware. I will let him relay the story since he takes more pleasure in doing so. They told us that a toaster was not alive. We proved them wrong empirically. And then that toaster became a member of the Federation Council. That was you. <laughs> yes, that was us. It was a very, very good toaster. It was Tevek's idea. I simply... It was. I simply... allowed for the thing to find life on our... And he sort of looks up. He's like, he's really just trying to think of like a word that makes sense for it. And it's like our, what I suppose a human would call plane of existence. As you have here and now. And, he, and then he walks back and now he is back to the to his desk and sort of uh, 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 stands there, just sort of attentive. Are you aware of how we, of, of what we have designed and its uses? And it's and it's gooses. I, <laughs> oh my god, he looks at you proud. I just do a little nod. I mean, she's not. She has no expression, but she did that for you. Yeah. Apology. I would like to apologize for my sister's emotional outburst. She has undergone colonar, and yet it did not seem to take. My brother is a bad influence on me. I am. It is true. Exio is smiling. She is not hiding any joy that she is taking from this conversation after the immense stress that she has been under all day. Um, I'm sorry. I just, I'm trying so hard, but I can't, I'm just, I'm picturing there's this, this, this running thing that happens in that, in that dark, violent series Hannibal where he just says this is my design after he's going through all of these murder scenes and I'm just picturing your character building this toaster <laughs> this is my design <laughs> this is Would our design like we both say it simultaneously this is our design <laughs> this is um this is how we get Cylons <laughs> yeah all right so please say we enlighten all. me um uh, Please enlighten me on the further use that this goose has. I will allow my sister to explain, as I believe she takes more pleasure in the telling of it. So the primary function of this probe was to determine the location of the shielded Romulan ship. We have outfitted it with a series of holographic emitters that will expand out in every direction. And our plan is that at least one of those will latch onto the Romulan ship and thus infect it with the goose that I understand has been troubling the ship for some time. 
if all things go as planned, the location of the Romulan ship will be revealed and its crew shall be distracted. Correct. And thus, and thus you shall, as commander, uh, do as you see fit with its crew. Uh, we are here to facilitate. Uh, obviously, we are not members of the Federation and therefore have no say in what comes after. But we trust that a commander as logical as yourself will determine a clear and clever route of action. It should be said that while the goose causes a great deal of emotional chaos to the Romulans aboard, it should also allow you a certain degree of control over the vessel, or at least the um, shutting down of primary defensive systems on said Romulan vessel. If the uh, We made a supposition that I suppose is a logical one, that you would not want the vessel destroyed. And so ideally, the vessel might be able to be locked down and even towed to a destination of your choosing. If the that destruction of the vessel is required, the particle fountain may be utilized in a further plan, but that would require some doing. That hopefully will not be necessary as the returning of the vessel is of utmost importance to the Romulan Empire. Um, a brownout of sorts would be ideal on their ship and um, weapons, shields, and maneuvering capabilities shut off so that we may tractor and haul it to be arrested and returned. We uh, are currently uh, at a time surplus due to the uh, natural brilliance of uh, my sister, this laboratory, and most importantly, Chief Tech, who I would uh, like to, who if I were in Starfleet, I would be recommending for uh, quite a uh, was it? Who, if I were to say, I would, uh, yes, yes, commendation. Thank you, sister. Uh, I would say promotion, but as I understand it, chief is the highest rank an enlisted officer can uh, achieve in Starfleet. If you were to create a new office for him, uh, it would be well deserved. You could call it tech. He could be tech, tech. I will take that under advisement. Thank you. You are, of course, welcome. This briefing is now concluded. <laughs> in an effort to share you, to uh, in an effort to spare you any further uh, embarrassment from my emotional outbursts, uh, I would like to invite you to leave the laboratory. But first, it is customary among our people to uh, present the following greeting when departing the company of one we admire: "Live long and, and prosper. prosper." However, considering your circumstances, I think it would be more appropriate to say, live forever and prosper. As I return the salute, um, I blip away without a word, and you immediately receive um, a notification from my automated counseling session that says, Exio's door is always open. <clears throat> when you uh, return to the bridge, the lieutenant seeing you reappear, Gers looks at you and says, Sir, should I? Well, should they access your chair, sir? Should I? Should I put them in the brig? Let's give them a pass for now. They are. We are quite indebted to them for the day. And I believe that that was a sort of. Um, a greeting. Yes, sir. They go back to the command console. <clears throat> I uh, extend a hand to um, the ambassador. Okay. Olin, are you ready to... Oh, oh. And I, I also um, look to our lovely lawyer. Um, <laughs> is everyone ready to read Mendek his rights? Shanto... You see, Asmi still looks pretty nervous, but she nods. He is a wanted fugitive himself and is in therefore no legal right to demand extradition of a prisoner. And let's make him aware of that fact. 
Would you like to do it? Mm. Let's send the probe. All right. That's how you're going to do it. Yeah. So uh, Tech will come onto the bridge for his engineering station, and, and we'll prep it and get it ready for you, Commander. OK. So I'll give notice, and you'll be the punchline. Why not? We've had a wonderful day of jokes. Let's mm. continue with him. Uh -huh. Oh, the biggest joke of the day. Mm. Let's go. Uh -huh. All right. I have to say, though, I'm a little bit disappointed. I'm the only one who didn't get to meet the twins. Well, they are and have always been on our ship. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. that you can always just say hello. <laughs> I'm sure I'll see them around at some point. <laughs> Or I guess I won't. We'll find out. <laughs> All right, let's do this. <clears throat> Vryn uh, swivels back in the chair and just says, I just want to give you all a heads up. If this thing pops the way we think it might, it's going to be a bumpy ride. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <clears throat> Shields are at full strength. Commander, we're ready when you are. We can start our 10 second countdown at your command. Let's open a hailing frequency then. Mm -hmm. Chief Tech, how long after the probe is launched that we will have confirmation that the goose has laid their egg? Well, it's hard to say, but it should be as soon as it hits. And how long does it take to launch a probe? So it'll be a 10 second countdown and then when the thing fires... It'll be immediate. It'll well no, it's it's going to have to interact with the particle fountain and detonate. That's so that's it'll... that's the timeline I want. How long till it'll be it... about 10, 10 seconds? Okay, so twenty and seconds. And then and then after as it is departing is when it's sending a shower of these hollow emitters out into space, casting a wide net. I just and, want to say, uh, out of character, this feels a little bit like trying to prep a, a message in D and D. Like sending, like you got the certain number of words before you like you get cut off. Like that's yeah, how yeah. this feels right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, just counting my sending stone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. I mean, yeah. Ideally, it's less of a like sheet and more of a of a three sixty sphere, so that we really have the best chance of hitting this guy. Right. It's a cone attack. Yeah. Exactly. We got. All this right. is our best AOE. All right. <clears throat> um. So roughly a few minutes is what you're saying for it to get to the um, 10 seconds countdown and then it fires and it's 10 seconds until the detonation. When the detonation happens, it should be, be just a few moments before the effects take place. So we're looking and, at about 30 seconds. Yeah, you're looking at about 20 seconds total, 25 seconds total. Okay, yeah. great. Um, then the code word is as soon as his rights are read and his charges have been lodged against him is when um, the, the probe is launched. Hi, right, sir. I'll have it ready. All right. Damn. Make the call. <clears throat> Hailing frequency is open. And I am standing this time next okay. to the ambassador. Okay. Um, a few moments pass, and Mendak once again appears on the view screen. He looks a little... You've seen him in his stoic form. He looks a little impatient right now as he appears on the screen and says, I trust you have news that I am looking forward to hearing. I really wish I could say that was the case. Unfortunately for both of, well, actually only for you. We have uh, been ordered by the Romulan Empire, not only to bring you in, but to return their ship you see, you are trying to get us to extradite a criminal. You are a criminal yourself, and your government would like you and their ship back. And so we intend to bring you and their ship back. I'm very sorry. You will not be getting Sorex back today, or any day. In fact, you are going right back where you belong. And I hope, Admiral Mendak, you have a very good representation. And transmission. Probe. The screen cuts off. <laughs> you fire the probe. The goose is loose, Commander. Nothing happens. Oh, shit. 
The moment you depress the moment you depress the controls, you see no confirmation of the probe launch. Oh, this isn't good. And then you hear on the comm coming through the engineering panel, like, Commander, there's somebody down here. And then probe is away. It launches. As the probe launches, you hear security down there saying that they had spotted an intruder. As they're shouting they spotted an intruder, you hear Gers at the tactical console go, incoming, shouting incoming, as all of a sudden a tactical display comes up. You see what looks like an enormous ball of plasma energy from underneath the Ross by about 600 kilometers straight up towards the engineering section. Shields are ready. As this red, ball of energy, the, the red size red of this plasma torpedo is enormous. It, 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 it's easily about the size of maybe a third of the saucer section. It's not a standard looking torpedo at all. This thing is a huge ball of energy, probably about the size of the deflector array. And it's headed straight for the bottom of the Ross. Um, just as it starts closing in, there's a detonation. Immediately, sensors light up as tetrionic energy begins to flood the area. Two things happen all at once. Tech, you get to see a security feed coming up side by side with watching the probe. And you see what looks like an Andorian in a fully black bodysuit leaping over what looks like uh, a stack, uh, like one of the containment units for torpedo warhead storage before vanishing into thin air as security is rushing them. Tetrions flood the space and the Ross is struck. The plasma torpedo is struck, the station is struck, and this cloaked Romulan warbird is struck. Shields immediately drop to zero. <laughs> the whole ship begins to shake and you all do the shimmy as the lights on the USS Ross begin to flicker. You see this wave of energy pulse out from the particle fountain as energy is channeled backwards and a spectacular explosion of all these hollow emitters that didn't make the impact popping in space like stars. <laughs> and power across the ship fluctuates dramatically. The Ross is gonna lose seven power as a systems drain hammers the ship. The station on, in front of you guys, the particle observer station, immediately goes offline. Sensors on the USS Ross scramble and all of a sudden the view screen goes and you lose all visuals. Sensors just go completely down. And emergency power comes back up online. The next weird thing that happens, oh, it's all a chain of events. The moment this thing pops, a chain of events just explodes into motion. The next weird thing happens is for the first time in your life, you experience what could accurately be described as an intense wave of dizziness, Exio. Okay. It immediately begins to just swarm into your head. And the next thing that happens is as this dizziness surges through you and you kind of lean forward in your seat, you feel a spike of terror. And so does Olin. Olin, you can feel Exio in a shock of horror suddenly, like they're losing all understanding of what's happening around them. Wait, did you just say I could... Feel you feel Commander Exio's fear in the seat next to you as she's her eyes widen and the holographic image of her flickers for a second. Exio, you're in a dark room and Redgrave is in front of you just as she was before and says, so you've made it at last. Ask your questions. I'm happy to answer them, Exio. What are you talking about? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asleep right now. What's going on? You're back on the bridge. <gasps> 
Uh, Olin has, like, reached over and grabbed Exio's hand. Um, your hand goes right through her hand on the console. You look down just in time to see that the hard particle lights that form your holographic matrix is not solid enough to actually touch Olin. You feel slight resistance, Olin, like you're touching force fields, but it's not enough. And there's a little bit of a scrambling effect. Exio, what's happening? I don't know. What's, what's the update? How's the, what's happening? I Since seem to have blacked on, out. I see anything. Science station is like, I've got nothing, Commander. I've got nothing. Is there any, any eyes on, eyes on Mentec now? The, Did it work? <laughs> Talon, the Benzite sitting at the science station goes, sensors are not online, Commander. I'm, 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 I have no vision. I have nothing. All right, Olin is going to try and reach out. You are detecting panic all over the ship. Can I push past that further? It's kind of a flood. And honestly, the proximity of Exio next to you is kind of overwhelming you. Exio's experiencing these emotions more intensely than anybody that you felt in the proximity. It's kind of jamming up the, the signal, as it were. So Olin isn't going to tell Exio that they can feel her just yet, because they're not going to, they don't want to freak her out. <laughs> okay. They're going to hold on to this for just, for just a little bit. Exio, I need you to breathe. <sighs> I'm breathing. I don't need to breathe. Let's go. Get Chief Tech and the twins up here now. We need this system online immediately. Are this is our right? one shot. Okay, Tech, I, I need I, you to make an engineering check, and you guys are coming up to the bridge? Uh, so, yeah, one assumes that the minute we felt shit shake, we would have been on the move. Yeah, yeah. The, the Ross just rolled. It wasn't yeah. just, like, getting hammered by something. It's like she got hit by a wave. Yeah. Uh, so given given the, the status of that wave, um, just to run this down for a second, uh, since we built this probe and it's like got proprietary, you know, holographics technology that is like the kind of stuff that we spend our time and life designing, um, can I have some manner of other way of accessing this thing beyond the ship if I rolled for it? Like, could I have built us a, say, a remote trigger? If you did, like it's that? offline. Oh, okay. So all... Current all Things are offline. Currently, the ship is on emergency power, and even tricorders are fluctuating right now. Okay. And I'm guessing the Ross can't be of any assistance for this role. No, the Ross is offline right now. She's on emergency power. You guys have no shields. You have no engines. You have no sensors. Mm-hmm. And what, navigation at that point. That Brent, we're off at, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. One quick thing. What is the talent yeah. that lets uh, the ship gain back power with us? We, we have a special talent of that. Mm-hmm. The ship does. Um, yep, that is the command I am ordering right now. Are both warp cores offline? Nope. You can use this. You can use the warp core in the saucer section as a redundant system to bring power back Great. to the ship. Turn that on, baby. All right, you are going to be making a roll here. Yeah. Um, you're not. Yeah, yeah. You will get an assist by the ship. So you're going to roll. So whoever wants to roll for the ship, it's engines plus engineering. And the difficulty here is four. And you want command and, or control? And, or, control engineering, yes. Where and, are we on momentum? Because I know we would have lost one from the scene. Yeah. So we're down to one. Okay, one. one. Go ahead. Uh, who, who's who's the lead role on this? Tech is. Yeah, I'll use spend it. it. And an extra one. And then, uh, ooh, let's see. Could I, hmm, could I use a value in technology makes life better? (laughs) Bit of a stretch. Or everyone can be helped. (laughs) That is a little closer. Yeah. Yeah. We are trying to restore power to the ship. I would like to burn a determination then and get two. Okay. So we're aiming for two more. Yes, yes, yes. That is a crit and another success. So that's three. So five total. And Anything of course, okay. poor, poor Ross is, is of no help. They're they're so distressed. But we gain um, So, Chief Tech at his engineering console, coordinating with the engineering teams in the secondary warp core in the saucer section, which, by the way, is just beneath you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, 
as you get power back online, about that point, the turbo lift doors open and the two twins step onto the bridge. Moments later, Chief, you see confirmation that the secondary warp core is active. Secondary systems um, take a step back as primary systems come back online. However, certain systems are still knocked offline. You have, you have maneuvering thrusters. You do have visual, you have weak sensors. Tractor beam is not functional, weapon is not functional, shields are non-functional. Sensors immediately let you know your position and the general area around you. Um, massive detonations, yes, Jody, massive detonations have been detected uh, all throughout this area of space. It looks like the detonation and interaction with the particle fountain has reacted with some of the hidden gravimetric disturbances naturally found within the Shackleton expanse. And what it's caused is a chain reaction that's popped off. As you're looking at the data coming in though, Tech, what's remarkable is the way it's popped off, it almost looks like energy, when the way the torpedo detonated, it almost looks like it almost looks like the energy and the explosion and the timing of when it detonated. First of all, the torpedo seems to have detonated exactly one second too early, which is not possible unless somebody tampered with it. And it's also giving off um, what looks to be a uh, polaric ion and energy. Okay. Which is destructive to say the least. It's usually found around subspace fractures. Um, to make matters more interesting, as you're looking at this data, Tech, mm -hmm. judging from the hot spots in the energy uh, uh, plumes that you're seeing in the explosions in deep space, you're seeing what looks like a connected web of, it, it seems like there was a, a series of gravimetric disturbances that were lurking out there near the particle fountain that hadn't been detected. Uh -huh. These have collapsed and are interacting with a lot of the energy that is flowing out of the particle fountain now. You're not sure exactly what's going on there, but if you didn't know any better, this looks artificial. Okay. Like I'm somebody sorry. tampered with the torpedo. Um, you also detect that the particle observer station is off axis and is currently lost its orbit. It's traveling at a pretty sustainable rate of speed, not in danger, but it is spinning out into space. You do detect the presence of a Tavaro class modified Romulan warbird about 60,000 kilometers, what would have been beneath you guys. The plasma torpedo that was about to slam into the Ross is nowhere to be seen. Either it was completely dissipated by the energy of the blast or it missed you, or maybe it hit the Ross and you need a damage report, you're not sure, but it's no longer on screens. You can tell that the Tavaro, modified Tavaro that's spinning out of control has also lost power and is spinning away from the Ross. The Ross itself is also off axis. She is currently rolling through space. So if you were to do a station look out the window, the Ross is literally spinning in over in from this. Did the, did the uh, hollow emitters manage to blast off of the probe before the probe? There's no data, but they were on track, judging from the trajectory before it detonated and the position of where that Romulan Warbird was headed, they probably got impacted by at least one of the hollow emitters. Great. Uh, I'm, Tech is gonna forward this information to C Citation Ops, uh, specifically okay. Dr. Yada. We could use your expertise on some of this. Picking up the pieces down here, Chief, but uh, I'll take a look at it right away. Uh, anything that, uh, anything regarding the, uh, extant particle physics uh, would be best handled, no uh, disrespect to Dr. Yada, by my sister, Tavek. Yes, uh, spatial anomalies are something of a specialty of mine. And Tech will make space by the console on the bridge. Yeah. It's all yours. Okay. She, she moved them. Vren, stop us. Vren is like, I've got maneuvering thrusters. I'm gonna see if I can stop our spin. Hang on. Thankfully, inertial dampeners are still working. I'm going to roll for a friend. He's going to try Otherwise, to stop a scale six capital ship from no, rolling right in space. Uh, you can see that Olin looks a little green around the gills. <laughs> well, thankfully, you're not feeling the spin, but don't look out the window right now. <laughs> that's why. That's why. Like, they're very, very, like, like they, they were looking out the window for a hot sec and then, like, nope. Yeah, don't do that. And, nope, don't nope. Do that. 
Um, oh, Vren, Vren, Vren. This is what Vren does. Control, con, so, team. Oh, that's two critical hits. I think that's going to be fine. I'm going to... Yeah, I'll give him an assist from Ross. Could you roll for the Ross for me? Um, this is going to be an engineering's, an engineering con check for the Ross. Uh, the difficulty on this was three, so let me know how many successes you got. How many? Two? One? Okay. So, uh, so it's four. So five. So gain two momentum. You guys gain two momentum. Um, Vryn says, okay. She's slowing down. 60 seconds. I've She's only got maneuvering thrusters. I don't have impulse power or warp drive right now. Uh, within within moments of stepping on the bridge, if Tavek has gone to the engineering thing, I've absolutely gone towards XEO and just immediately asked, um, Captain, is there any instability in your hollow matrix? I... I'm usually able to touch her. She she was a little bit more incorporeal than usual. Uh, I just want to do a, a quick diagnostic. <laughs> you just want to scan in front of XEO? Yeah, literally with my hand. I don't need to like scan for diagnostic. I just want to make sure that like she is corporeal. And you are detecting something impossible. XEO is exhibiting what looks like, I, I would actually, you know what? I'm gonna say you need to roll for this. Great, love it. So do a reason science check. Okay. Can I still feel her? Yes. Uh, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my focus of hollow technology into this. Okay, um, yeah, that totally which, counts. Which, uh, which does what again? I'm sorry, I'm still learning. This. It means, uh, so what's your science rating? Right, so it makes my science rating my crit rating. Got you. Yeah. And uh, I and then I am going to use one of my values uh, and a burn it on this, which is Exio is the future. Did you already burn a value this game though? I have not. I, I don't. You think have not. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna. <laughs> that is so literally that, the value he took. So that adds a d20, right? Uh, no, that gives you an automatic critical success. Oh, nice. Okay. So I'm rolling. So now you roll your dice. Got it. And then I'm rolling two d20 on this. Uh, ba, 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 ba. sorry, just making sure I understand what I'm doing. Yeah, okay, good. And I'm trying to beat my reason and my science together, make up 16. Uh, I'm under on both, but I don't crit on either. So with the critical success, it's four successes. Okay. Um, so here's the way this works. I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question. And if you right. want to know more information, you can spend momentum to obtain more information. Love it. So you were scanning XEO to find out if she is stable? Yes. Her hollow matrix is completely stable right now. Great. Uh, so I, 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 so then um, I want to just spend one momentum okay. to- um, Ask like, a new question and I'll answer it. Yeah, effectively. Um, but like, yeah, even narratively what I'm, I'm kind of getting this out of, because ideally I need information from the scene to do <clears> this. <throat> um, I would I'd sort of do the, I do the hand motion through and be like, okay, XEO's stable. Yeah. Um, and then, sorry, baby, no. My cat really wants to play with us. <laughs> All right. And then uh, I turn to uh, I turn to the counselor um, and say, uh, the are ambassador? you the ambassador? I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say, do you detect anything strange? So what's weird, Olin, is you're feeling XEO it's like she's sitting next to you, but you're also aware that her, the sensations of who Exio is is coming from the computer core. I felt fear from you. From me? The computer core, you. That's impossible. So, okay, now there's my question, Eric, um, which up? is, uh, do I have any understanding of what would allow a, uh, you're a Delton, correct? Mm. What would allow a Delton or similar species- Empath. To, right, an empath to detect uh, the thoughts uh, or like conscious emotions of a holographic entity? Have I ever seen anything like <clears throat> 
There, yes. As somebody who is specialized in hollow technology, this is, to, to your knowledge, this has not happened. Except for there are instances in the past 15 years of Starfleet history, especially specifically dealing with AI, where empaths have noted that they have felt the presence of artificial intelligence. Most notably was the instance, the, the first instance that's most notable is probably um, the creation of Data's daughter, Lal. Mm -hmm. Was probably uh, one of the first times that uh, an AI was actually sensed by an empath. Um, do it I, do has I have, happened since. Do I have any sense of like, like um, uh, continual events inside of that? Like that the idea of like, not, not just like has it happened, but when it has happened, are, are there any um, common factors? Anomalies or anything like that that's going on? No, just yeah, just common factors. Like, is there a, is, is there a, uh, I'm trying to sort of suss out <clears throat> if the hollow matrix- We'll make that part of your question. This is a um, bug, right. I'm trying to it, suss out whether or not this is evidentiary of a bug. You're not sure, but but it obviously has to coincide with the energy burst that just took place. It's the only logical conclusion to come to. Um, there might be something with her hollow matrix taking place right now that's unusual. Got you've it. detected that she's stable, and you've gotten this new piece of information. If you want to learn any more information, it's another momentum spend. Understood. Uh, I think I'll hold off on that. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, I, so I, I, I turn uh, <clears throat> I turn back to uh, Exio and just go, um, Though I have no doubt that you have subroutines dedicated to this specific task, I hope that you will keep an eye on yourself, Captain. Such an event can be dangerous for biologics, but can also be dangerous for holographic life forms. It you hear a breathless science officer at the front of the ship, the Benzite Talon, just go, Captain? Drawing everyone's attention back to the view screen. Now what? Sensors are mostly down. So you're not getting any immediate readings, but you can't deny what your eyes are seeing. There is something moving towards the Ross. Something or someone? Something. Does that thing have a face? Doesn't look like it, no. In fact, it looks- Can I feel looks... coming from it? Yes. Actually, Olin, yes, you can. Oh, um, it looks like, a, comically from this range, it looks like a giant carpet, like a piece of cloth that's just kind of floating towards the ship. But as it gets closer, the sensors, I'm gonna roll a scan here. It's two successes immediately sensors indicate a life form. Approximately 83 meters long, 34 meters wide. It has almost a metallic sheen to its skin. Down the dermal layer, it's silvery pale like metallic sheen. And then it has this blot of purple that just goes down the dead center of its back. It resembles a giant flatworm from Earth. Only this one's over 200 feet long. And it's swimming through space. And the first thing that you think as you're seeing this, Olin, as you're all seeing this, everyone's just dead silent on the bridge. The only way you were able to spot it is because it's silhouetted from the background, a burst of light coming from the particle fountain. But as it's closing in at rapid speed, Olin, you were detecting a wave of insatiable curiosity. I think we have an explorer out there. And I think they have questions. I, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I look at you, uh, Tyvek, and, and just, I, I think we all have a lot of them. But we also have, <clears throat> oh, where are the Jashashians? Can we um, see they're, them? Yes, they're still within range. Again, the, uh, the Are station they flying actually, out of orbit? Are they in danger? No. The station, the structure of the station itself was large enough that it actually managed to take a lot of the brunt of that impact without a problem. And judging from what sensors are telling you, there's, their power systems are slowly coming back online as well. They are not in immediate danger. And they're probably, they're probably seeing what you're seeing right now. <laughs> 
I, I have a question. As someone with focuses in both uh, spatial anomalies and xenobiology, is there anything I can roll to sort of get some information on what it is we're looking at? Yeah, you can look at the sensor readings and make a roll. What's up, Exio? May I? I want to assist yes. them. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to blip on the outside of the ship and get a good look at it. Exio just goes, noise. And I want to relay everything that I am looking at. Um, I'm going we to don't be... do double assist, do we? Because I, I no. would have. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Single assist. So Exio, again, you appear on the great gray steel horizon of the USS Ross uh, saucer section. This giant city of a ship underneath your feet that's just stabilized. And from out here in the vacuum of space, you can see the spectacular explosion of prismatic colors erupting out of subspace from the particle fountain a million or so kilometers away. And emerging and getting closer and closer is this life form. You can see the station. You cannot see the Romulan warbird from here because it is far underneath uh, where you are, sort of the south where you are. Of course, to underline the enormity of the USS Ross, being that she's just a few hundred meters um, wider than, or rather, no, she's like 30 meters rather longer than a galaxy class. This is an insanely huge ship. So you're standing on this, on this plane of starship hull that extends as far as you can see and in front of you is the galaxy and this creature moving towards you at 200 feet long at, at 83 meters long and 34 meters wide you can still see it um, advancing and at about that point i need you jody to go ahead and make your reason science check and if you could assist here whoever wants to roll for the ross this is sensor sensor science but because you guys are limited on sensors right now it's going to be at an increased difficulty of three. Uh, do we, do we um, have momentum to use? We do. OK, I'm yeah. going to use one for cautious science again then. Um, Eric, can I argue that I use insight medicine as I'm studying a creature? And not yes. A... Yeah. Do you have xenobiology or anything like that? Or um, no, but of... I can make it. <laughs> That's true. You can dot .exe it. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead and make it. And then, right. um, and then yeah, go ahead and make your roll. Tell me what y'all get. Jody's doing the frowny face. Jody, Jody becomes an emoji when. when <laughs> well, uh, uh, that's that's one crit. Uh, two, so two. Uh, that's three successes total. But then I also rolled a twenty, so a complication. Hmm. Uh, the Ross got you, a crit. Okay. And so did Exio. Oh. Oh wow. wait, I can. I, I, I used uh, I used cautious science, so I can reroll that twenty. Yes, you can. <laughs> I got an 11, so that's a third success. So, uh, or, or fourth success. So, four so successes. So, total successes? Four from the ship and I, and... Four from me. So eight? Eight. Okay, so... <laughs> so, gain five momentum. Um, you guys, as sensor data is coming in, the sensors come back on the USS Ross. This is a never-before-encountered life form. Judging from its trajectory and from your theory, Jody, you can confirm that this thing emerged from the particle fountain. It seems to have crawled, it came out of subspace, probably drawn here by the explosion, and is deeply curious about the USS Ross from the looks of it. It would appear that we have awoken a resident of this area who would perhaps like to learn as much about us as we would like to learn about it. Then I would very much like to make sure that this creature, like the Jashashians, do not keep encountering violence. I want to try to walk around to look at Taiva, or to look at um, Mendez's ship. I want to walk the. You're going wanna... to have to. You're going to have to blink onto the bottom of the hull and look. Right. <laughs> I want to keep my eye on him. So appearing sure. in the bottom of the ship and looking up, the vastness of space, haha, <laughs> Jackson, is it makes it impossible to actually visually spot this thing. The it's he, his ship, judging by the trajectory, is probably a couple of hundred thousand kilometers away by now. And in the vast darkness of space, you're not able to visually spot it. Your sensors would be able to pick it up, but right now, what's up? Uh, to, to that exact point, I'd like to. Um move towards the science station to the seemingly panicked science officer and very rudely supplant them at the station. 
Oh, well, <laughs> currently the nearest science station to you is actually the one your sister is sitting at. Oh, I thought that was an engineering station. My bad. Uh, Great. Then I'll, then yeah, I'll go. Yeah, there's, there's environmental controls and science stations up on the top of the bridge. The main science Love station, it. science officers down below, but she's basically reading what Jody's doing right now. Got it. Yeah. All right. I, all I want to be able to do is just try to run the scanners on specifically uh, uh, that and the hollow emitter. I'm my my like Stavek is a is a one track mind boy at this point and okay. it did the goose work. I'll give you this. Looking at the sensor data and the brief snippet of information you got before he began to spin out of sensor range for the damages y'all took to your sensors. Mm -hmm. Every piece of evidence would indicate the hollow emitter went off. Uh, all right, great. So uh, at the thing, I type it up and I look and I go, ha ha, it does in fact have many gooses, sister. <laughs> and, uh, and then... <laughs> so the goose is not cooked. No, in fact, the goose is loose and cooking yes well it is cooking their systems as it is now loose inside of their neural net pathways as me sitting a few feet away just goes the cat is going to be so happy she missed this <laughs> um i uh and then yeah basically i want to um uh sort of i guess tag to xeo and be like uh captain it, it Yes, Lenny, I know. All right. Uh, it's Kat. She's like moving shit. She's loving mm. this. Big Star Trek fan. Uh, I say, uh, Captain, we must find a way to move our vessel closer to the Romulan vessel before we lose it entirely from sensor range. They are currently dealing with a goose epidemic, and I do believe any recovery effort should be made, well, now. We're going to need to repair the engines first, Captain. We, I've only got maneuvering thrusters at the moment. Uh, oh, you're muted. Are we... Question. What's up? Who's next in line after me? After you? Uh, yeah. That would... Well, they're all gone. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. Who is next to take command? Uh, that would actually probably be... Uh, Lieutenant uh, Rogers, currently okay. the security officer on the bridge. Um, uh, Lieutenant, your orders are as follows. Um, we need to recover Mendek's ship and, and secure him before he is able to corral the geese. Um, and that is still our priority. Um, and then I look to Tech and I say, take power from my systems. I'm going offline. We need to have this ship get Mendek now. Uh, even if we were to take your power, Exio, I, I don't know if that would be a fast solution. We still need to repair everything. What needs to be repaired? System diagnostic, please. So if you want to get the engines back up online, essentially yeah. what you're looking at is a How much rate. power am I requiring that is taking it to... Thankfully, Exio, in a desperate situation, taking you offline would do the trick. In this case, what's probably going to work for you is you guys are in a race. Essentially, your engineering repair teams are going to be racing yeah. against their engineering repair teams. Yeah, and I'm saying taking down some of my power and siphoning it to engineering would be helpful in this scenario, correct? Really I'm not good. saying take me offline. I'm saying bring down my power grid a little so that the power is being um, redistributed to where it is necessary. That is the captain's job. That is an exo's job, diverting power where it is needed most. And that is requiring me to go offline for a minute. Hi, Commander. And I'll do it. Okay. You are still outside the ship at this moment? Oh, no. I, I, I blipped back, back to, back um, yeah. Okay. Uh, you take one last look at the view screen as this creature is moving just off the saucer section. It's beautiful, Exio. The skin has got a metallic sheen to it, and it's the light that's being cast across the skin of this animal, this creature, this being, is lit up by the particle fountain. It starts to shift suddenly. And Olin, you begin to feel a shift in emotion, like an alarm. 
and the curiosity turns towards cautious retreat as suddenly the animal just sort of begins to sort of swim its way back through space at incredible speed for a biological life form, probably close to full impulse as you watch it vanish back towards the particle fountain. And the klaxon alert goes off in the ship as Exio, that's the last thing you hear is the alert going off as you go offline. <laughs> and you hear the science officer go, what now? Tech, as you're looking down at the controls, those chain reactions and the gravimetrics, uh, those eddies, you see they reach a crescendo and suddenly the ship lurches as a gravitational field forms out in the middle of space in front of the particle fountain. And before your eyes, you watch space go and a wormhole oh, no! begins to expand in front of the ship. In three-dimensional space, it looks like a globe that is a hole in three dimensions. And it's only there for just a few seconds, long enough for an Orion Raider to appear. And it goes <laughs> and collapses. You see floating towards the USS Ross is what looks like an Orion Interceptor. Uh, is it and my baby? You hear over the channels, Ross, is this, is this working? We're back, Ross. Get off the channel. Yes, yes, we hear you, we hear you. I need to speak to Commander Exio. You hear Com Captain Sol's voice. What's oh. the status of the ship? Well, Captain, uh, this is Chief Tech. Uh, Commander Exio is sort of out of commission at the moment and we're drawing a reserve power but it's great because we've got two warp cores what two <laughs> and that <laughs> my friends <laughs> is where we wrap up tonight's extraordinary episode <laughs> of clear skies the honkitude was off the charts <laughs> off. so much honk Oh. What the fuck? Oh, <laughs> Captain, don't be mad at me. I'm protecting our ship. <laughs> I, think, I think it's more like Olin's probably feeling the shock of like, what happened to my commander? Like, <laughs> I think that's I mean, probably... Sol, there's just a little bit too much emotion happening here. The, if there's anything that's going to make Captain Sol fail a Kluros check, it's hearing that their commander is offline and getting yes. all of that from the intercept. I'm just like, yeah, no. Nope, you can imagine what this interceptor is detecting. Seeing the Ross barely holding its station keeping, the station actually, smiling out. There's a there's a Devaro class warbird that's spinning out of control without power. There's an Sam, alien if, life form that's literally flying past them. Sam, <laughs> if you're if you are in chat, roll a clear host check right now. And they they are. are. They very much are. Do, 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 do they roll Claros checks? They yeah, do. Yeah, they use my they use our system, Jack. I That's really awesome. want to like. Isn't that share. great? I, I love I I I love Cleros checks, and I'm just gonna I, I gotta I gotta just derail us for a second on Cleros checks. But I love Cleros they failed checks because uh, good good Cleros checks are only good when you fail. Uh, they uh, yes they, maybe because it it led to more amazing moments for Gina's character in our Trek game than I can imagine. But also because I saw Gina use it in real life once. Gina got like twenty <laughs> people into a party on a Cleros check once. I like saw her do it at Comic-Con, like live in person. And it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen anyone do. She was so polite that it like crit success against a, against a bouncer and got 20 of us into a party. It that was, right. it was legendary stuff. Into the VIP the section. Party. Yeah, you got us into legendary huh. VIP before any of us were on Vast. It was amazing. Anyway, sorry, that's my yay Clarice. Well. That's going to bring it into our episode tonight, y'all. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jody and Jackson, for giving us the greatest twins we have ever seen in Star Trek. Thank you. Like, they're nice. <laughs> What's that? I want them forever. Yeah. yeah. Well, we hopefully we can be back at some point and do yeah, more. Yeah, I would love to have y'all back. Oh man, I'd love to have y'all back. Literally anytime. This was so we much. We will fun. make all the toasters talk. 
All of them. You had a brave little toaster. That was that was, that was Jody's idea, by the way. She she put the the, the sentient toaster thing in our character creation. Yeah, that was one hundred percent pulled from Red Dwarf. Would you like some toast? Yeah, yeah. yes, Jody toast. <laughs> and now it's all right, everybody. Catch us back here next Monday night at 6.30 p.m. We are at the climax of the Romulan story arc now. Mindak is currently helplessly floating through space. The captain has returned with a lot of revelations in tow. It'll be an interesting episode. So catch us next week, 6.30 p.m. here on Q Times. And Phoenix Dawn Command, by the way, that Tomorrow. is coming up. So stay tuned to cute times for that because that is right around the corner and all literally right around the corner. It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow, in fact, at five thirty, I believe. Um, seven thirty. Six, I think. Oh, but just check actually, time. actually, I mean, we have Jake here. He can literally come in like the voice of God and tell us what time it starts. Yeah, five thirty. Five thirty. Thank you. Um, so tune in to uh, Phoenix Dawn Command's first episode is tomorrow. So if you're in the mood for some more good RPG, that's where to go. We will catch y'all next Monday night. Until then, my friends, hailing frequencies are closed. <laughs>